Today is the 5th of January 2023 and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Ben Winspear. Ben, welcome to School Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. I'm very happy to be here speaking with you today. Me too. Thanks for having me, Emilio. No problem. Good to be here. Well, let's begin with an introduction. Ben, born in 1968 in Hartlepool, England, you grew up in Bendigo, Australia after your family immigrated here in 1974. You are a third generation Melbourne based painter who works predominantly in the mediums of oil and watercolour. Your work covers a wide range of subject matter from portraiture and still life to the human figure and landscape. Out of all these subjects, you are most drawn to the abundance of colours and infinite compositional arrangements offered by the Australian landscape and the tremendous expressive potential of the portrait and the human figure. Beginning your early years working as an earth mover and coming later to painting in your 30s, art has always been an integral part of your life. You have been painting professionally for over 21 years and have held several solo and group exhibitions in Australia, as well as being a sought after judge for art exhibitions around Victoria and New South Wales. You are the recipient of many awards, including the AME Bale Travelling Scholarship and Art Prize in 2016, and were nominated the Victorian Artist Society Mavis Little Artist of the Year, also in 2016. In 2015, you won the Nada Hunter Award for your painting, Emily in Black Dress, and were highly commended for your self-portrait in the Victorian Art Society Portrait Exhibition in the same year. You also won the Castlemaine James Farrell Self-Portrait Prize in 2003, and this painting is now part of the Castlemaine Art Museum's permanent collection. More recently, you received the Victorian Art Society Winter Exhibition Senior Art Supplies Prize for your painting, Storm Over Streeton Country, Mount Abrupt in 2020. Between 2008 and 2009, you served a two-year term on the City of Greater Bendigo Arts and Cultural Advisory Committee, and in 2010, you were commissioned to create a sculpture by the City of Greater Bendigo at California Gully Play Space in Bendigo. You have received several portrait commissions throughout your life, and recently have had the opportunity of painting Melbourne QC, Philip Dunn, which you commenced painting in 2019 in his chambers and are still in the process of completing. You are a sought after teacher and have taught at the Brighton Art Society, Victorian Artists Society, the Australian Guild of Realist Artists, Doncaster Tempesto Art Society and have run numerous workshops and demonstrations around Victoria and New South Wales. You have led multiple art projects in public and private schools and facilitated projects in conjunction with local government and private departments, including Colbine Water, the National Council of Churches in Australia and the Department of Primary Industries. You also host your own workshops and retreats as well as online teaching. You are a Michael Harding Paints Ambassador as well as an Ambassador for NEF Australia. Now Ben, I understand art has always been in your blood. You grew up in a creative environment around lots of art materials as your mother used to paint and was interested in crafts such as silk painting, screen printing and embroidery amongst other creative pursuits. Some of your earliest memories of art were seeing your grandfather's watercolours, portraits and life drawings. I understand your grandfather, named William Strachan, was an accomplished amateur portrait painter in London and would have loved to pursue a career in portraiture, however he had a family to support and the Great Depression to contend with. In your childhood, on some Sunday afternoons, your mother would take out your grandfather's paintings and go through them, explaining where each one was painted. Your mother was aware of where the paintings took place as she accompanied your grandfather around Europe as a child and watched him paint. What can you recall of those Sunday afternoons and how did seeing your grandfather's work impact you as a child? 
Look, I just think that, uh, yeah, some of my earliest life memories of seeing my grandfather's work and, um, yeah, my mother even had a few framed on the wall. So it's just from my very first memories, I remember seeing the paintings. That's great. Yeah. So you used to be there sitting on a, sitting down on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Your mother would take them out and you just had a, did you talk about them or you just looked at them? No, I just looked at them. Yeah, yeah. I just, and even back then, I just remember. I remember being fascinated and having some sort of affinity with painting. That's fantastic. Great. At that point, did it feel like something that you were destined to do? No, no. Sure. It just, in, in hindsight, uh, yeah, I, I definitely felt a connection, but no, not consciously. Sure. Now, was your father practicing art as well, or was it only your mother and grandfather? No, no, my father was as well. He was painting a watercolour. Oh, and, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was he working in the realist tradition? Yes, yes, loved painting boats. Oh, great. Particularly sailing ships. Fantastic. Were yeah. they from life, or did he work from photographs? Uh, from photographs. I see. Um, so the town where I was born in, where they were from, is obviously on the coast, so sure. um, they were interested in boats. Fantastic. Yeah, maritime subjects. Very nice. Rembrandt was an artist who you were well aware of as a child. How were you initially introduced to his work? Well, of course, my parents had um, books on art, art history, and as a child, I loved to just lay on the floor on my stomach, as children do, and, you know, pour through these books and look at the pictures, even before I could read the text. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, I just grew up with Rembrandt paintings, and uh, uh, one, not so much Rembrandt then, but uh, a particular drawing by Leonardo da Vinci of the Holy Family. Okay. Yeah, it just still sticks in my mind today of just absolutely fascinated by it. Did you try to copy it all or were you just looking at the pictures at that point? I honestly can't remember. I think just pretty much looking at the pictures. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. As you grew up, you painted Australian wildlife, typically birds and animals, until gradually you fell in love with portraiture. That sounds like a lovely way to spend your childhood and a rich education by quietly observing nature and painting what you see. Can you reminisce those days and explain the place that drawing and painting occupied in your life? I sure can, because actually I was homeschooled. Were you? Yes, oh. so both of my parents were teachers, trained teachers, although my mother never practiced having a, a large family. but. Um, when, when we uh, came to Australia, I went to school for a couple of years and then my parents decided to homeschool all of us. Wow. So for, you know, I only went to school for, I think it was like three years, two and a half years, and uh, for the rest of the time I was homeschooled. So wow. as, as part of, you know, that education, my parents let us, you know, focus on some of the things that we had a natural affinity for. And of course, mine was for drawing and painting and just working with my hands. That's great. So I explored all sorts of arts and crafts um, at those times. Sure. And did you, do you have a lot of uh, siblings at all? Yeah, so I have five siblings. I have one brother and four sisters. Mm -hmm. Out of all of them, are you the creative one? I am. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Lovely. The idea of becoming an artist wasn't really planted in you until after you were 30. As you got older and became an adult, you lived a fairly ordinary life. I understand you held various jobs, working in a number of trades, and you eventually found yourself driving earth-moving machinery. Up to that point, you never really thought about becoming a full-time artist. During these years, working in these various roles, did you still practice art in your spare time? No, no, not until that time when I decided that, uh, you know, I needed a hobby. Sure. But in hindsight, um, it wasn't so much that it didn't come to me, is in hindsight, I always realised it was there. I was just, you know, you have uh, the sort of norms that you're supposed to follow and responsibilities you have. Sure. And those things push, you know, and you hear this quite often with artists, you know, those life things push it aside. So it's always there. It's just how long can you avoid it before it really starts to, you have to listen to that voice. Sure. But as a child, of course, you were experimenting with drawing yeah. as children usually do yeah yeah so you know my parents used to talk about the war as well and yeah so I grew up drawing lots of airplanes and battles and you know all the all the stuff kids draw boys draw particularly you know people getting sh 
killed, you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Sure. Tanks, boats, everything, mm -hmm. aeroplanes. And were you looking at uh, references or just drawing from imagination? Uh, a bit of both. Bit of both. both. Yeah. yeah, sure. How did you discover the painter Lance McNeil and what led you to start training with him? So at the time when I decided that uh, I needed some training, uh, I went to a, another tutor and uh, it wasn't hugely successful. I didn't feel like she had much to offer and a, uh, a friend of my, a family friend, um, was going to Lance McNeil and she said, look, you know, when she saw what I was doing, she said, I think you really need to go and see this fellow. Mm -hmm. So I did, I took a painting along and uh, he wasn't an easy fellow to um, get you to accept, uh, get him to accept you, but uh, obviously he saw something of potential and said, yeah, I'll take you on. So, yeah. And what was your age approximately at this point? Uh, around about 30. So you're, you're about 30 when yeah, this happened? 30 yeah, 31. Interesting. And Lance himself, was he trained in the realist tradition? Yeah, and I wish, uh, now, I really wish I'd listened to uh, much more of, you know, the tutors he mentioned, but uh, all sorts of people, Dargie and, you oh, know, wow. a lot of those famous um, uh, people. Mm -hmm. Even, uh, uh, is it Kenneth, Kenneth Jack? Okay. Um, yeah, so... That was one of his teachers? I think so, yeah, at some stage. Oh, wow. That was great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. So he came out of a great tradition of painting as well. Sure, sure. Sounds like a real rich experience to have started with it him. It was amazing. He look, you know, if you could count a handful of people that changed your life, he's right up there. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Was he very um, uh, old-fashioned in regards to his, his teaching, yeah. very strict? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. yep, yep. You didn't, you know, no back chatting or mucking around <laughs> or it was like, you know, and if you're here, you're here to learn and you're here to do it and do it well. And not only that, and I continue on this today, he really instilled in me the pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Can you explain the curriculum that Lance set for you and what the key points were that you took away from his teaching? So he had, you know, different, he had classes during the day, but because I was working, obviously I couldn't attend those, although I did occasionally when, you know, it was a public holiday or something and I was able to go along. So I just went along one evening, uh, Wednesday evening, um, for three hours and, um, he, you know, it was different for every student. He'd assess where you were at and, you know, started everyone off with drawing. Yeah. Which is where I get my love of drawing from as well. Sure, sure. I started everyone with drawing, particularly around the uh, Chemon Nicolaides book. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Natural Way to Draw. Yep, yep. Which is on my list. And, uh, yeah, so then he would progress into black and white painting and then into colour painting. Sure. So these Wednesday uh, weekly sessions, how many years or months did you So I, I attended for? for about five years. Oh, wow. And I went to a couple of the retreats he held at King Valley. That's great. Which now extend to, you know, me running them there. Of as course, well. yeah. So that's fascinating, Ben. So it's interesting you started uh, your formal art training really when you were 30 years old. Pretty much, yes. That's incredible. Yes. Great. It was Lance that helped you understand the life and work of Rembrandt, is that correct? Correct. So he was a big fan of Rembrandt and Caravaggio and the Chiara Scuro method. Mm. And, uh, you know, again, instilled in me just the love of light, of, of realising that the most ordinary subject can be transformed by light. Sure. Fantastic. And when he would talk to you about Rembrandt, would he often, was it in a presentation format or was it just it was individual all, chat, one-on-one? -on -one? Um, uh, in a group, um, not, not so much formal presentation, but he would, um, you know, every week bring in a book out of his library, um, you know, or a print he had of, you know, a Rembrandt or another famous artist and explain, you know, give us some insights into it. Sure. So from... From the get-go, he instilled in me to just be a student, not consciously saying it, but being a student of the craft, of constantly studying other artists mm -hmm. and learning from them. Sure. Fantastic. That's uh, great advice. Yeah. Strong advice. I understand you had a revelation when you were 30. You came home from work one day and said, quote, there's got to be more to life than this. I really need a hobby, unquote. You got out your watercolour pencils and put pencil to paper. In that very moment, you realised that art was what you wanted to do with the rest of your life. 
As you stated, quote, it was a natural decision. It's all I wanted to do, unquote. You decided then and there that you would be a full-time artist. This is quite incredible and it seems that you saw your future with great, great clarity at that point. Can you recall that period of your life and was there a lot leading up to that decision being made? And what was your family's opinion of it all? Uh, so there's a lot in that. Um, you know, I could write a book about the whole process, <laughs> but basically yeah, it was. It's about the only real aha moment I've ever had in my life. Okay. Um, you know, what was leading up to that? I was really leading a pretty ordinary life, pretty boring, working, you know, with trades, earth moving machinery. Nothing against tradies, I love them dearly, but they can be pretty one dimensional. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after a while, someone who, you know, wants to or has this love of art and creativity in them, it just, and my, again, Lance McNeil used to say to us, if it's in you, it's going to come out sometime or another. Yeah, right. And I think it was just a gradual culmination of it coming to the surface and just, you know, almost. I wouldn't say forcing its way out, but certainly demanding to be attended to. And that's when I, you know, picked up these pencils that I happened to have. And it was, yeah, just an aha moment. Aha moment. This mm -hmm. is what I want to do with the rest wow. of my life. Naively, because um, I had no idea what a professional artist was. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. At, at that point, you were starting with Lance, though, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that's when I went to this other tutor, and then uh, uh, um, within a few weeks, came along to Lance. Okay. So okay. it all happened in right. quite a, a reasonably short space of time. Okay. So prior to starting with Lance, you actually were studying for another uh, artist, uh, yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I just went to a few classes, and it was very informal, and uh, mm. you know, quite basic, and it didn't really cover anything that I didn't re really order already know sure I knew I needed something um, better sure sure do you recall the name of that particular teacher uh, not off the top of my head sure that's fine so that's really interesting Ben you come home from work one day I mean I've, I suppose we've all had these experiences where we we come home from work and we really question well there's got to be more more to life than this and you just have this light bulb moment yeah and you decided then and there that you were going to dedicate the rest of your life to pursuing art full-time. I, I was, yeah. That's incredible. At that point, was your family concerned at all that you were leaving a, a full-time job to dedicate dedicate your life to the painting? Well, again, you know, I could write a whole book about it. So, you know, uh, I don't think they, they didn't really take to it too kindly. And, you know, it's been a long process of, of education, educating myself, trying to navigate a way through it. Um, what, I've been doing this for over 20 something years now and I only feel like I'm just getting a hang of it all mm. because there's really no, you know, you can go to an art school or to classes and learn how to paint but there is nobody giving you instruction of how to become a professional artist. Sure. Because once I realised I didn't want to do anything else mm. as in I just want to do that 8 hours a day, 10 hours a day and uh, that's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds possibly in some ways selfish and you do hear people say that, but um, look, if it's in you and that's what you're made to do, then you really have no choice. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yeah, I won't go into it all, but uh, yeah, it was certainly a challenge for my family. And I imagine as well making the shift from receiving a full-time income from a, a full-time job to, you know, trying to get by as an artist would have been... Yeah. It well, that was a huge, used to. and that was a huge part of it, um, because you can't exist on nothing. That's right. And um, you know, things go up all the time, as we know. And um, yeah, just navigating through that mm -hmm. was a big part of it. Sure, sure. Throughout art history, we see that painters usually start their training from a very young age, usually in their early teenage years. Have you found that getting a, a later start has disadvantaged you in any way? Not that I can consciously uh, pinpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, if I'd gone to an academy, in, you know, in my young teenage years, then obviously I would be much more advanced. But no, I certainly don't wish. You know, I hear, often hear people say, "I wish I'd started earlier." But no, I never think like that. I, mm -hmm. you know, I actually am more grateful for 
having because not only driving earth moving machinery i've done all sorts of things i've ridden horses for a living i've um, carted hay i've done all sorts of things mm -hmm. um, mainly outside so i think working outside most of my life and working with my hands and on a lot of rural properties has really given me a love of nature and i think and life experience and i think i really bring that into my painting so um, I think that could be one of the dangers of starting to learn to paint too early is that you then don't get, you know, good life experience. So, mm -hmm. no, I'm grateful for the way it's all worked out. Sure. And I suppose one of the advantages of, of, of starting painting in, in your 30s is that you, you would have already had that life experience. So you really would have had a clearer sense of what you wanted to say through your work. Correct. Correct. Fantastic. But having said that, yeah, it's an ongoing and has been and is an ongoing journey of what do I really want to say. Mm -hmm. So at that point when you had started in your 30s, was your draftsmanship fairly acceptable or were you still very much still learning to represent what you saw with a, a certain fidelity to nature? Uh, it was pretty good actually because um, you know I had quite a bit of an encouragement and tuition, informal tuition from my, my mother and father. Um, you know, dad drawing aeroplanes and tanks and um, you know mum yeah, encouraging us to pick flowers out of the garden or bring in you know fungi or insects and draw and paint those so mm. I've been drawing and painting observationally for as long as I can remember. Fantastic great. Moving on considering your subject matter you are predominantly concerned with the portrait figure and landscape in particular, you have a high affinity to the Australian landscape, as you have stated. Quote, I get out and about a lot painting plein air as it helps me keep in touch with nature and my environment, both urban and rural, and I believe painting from life helps also keep in my work a certain level, level of authenticity. Unquote. In fact, you often paint landscapes from the back of your car when en route to teach classes or workshops. What is it about the Australian landscape that absorbs you? In some ways I know, and in a lot of ways I don't know. I'm still discovering that. Um, I just, some of the things, the majesty of it, the colours, and again, you know, I do attribute a lot of this to Lance McNeil, um, his absolute love of Heysen, mm. um, and Heysen's process of good drawing and painting, but then going further than that, of, you know, illustrating and showing us and helping us understand that there was a real love of nature and particularly gum trees mm. in Heysen's work, as we know. Sure. Um, and, you know, the Flinders Ranges, and, um, you know, I think that, that really rubbed off on me of just really, because it wasn't, he would very actively show us, you know, look at those beautiful colours in the dry grass, look at the violets in the shadows, look at the blues in this. And, uh, you know, on retreats, he would take us for a walk down the river and point out all sorts of amazing, um, you know, particularly colour things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a sparked, and, you know, having worked outside a lot in my life and have an affinity with nature and animals, it all sort of coalesced into this real love of Australia and Australian landscape. Sure, you seem very much at home in the in oh, landscape. I love it. I love it. Great. I understand that you lived in Harcourt, Victoria for a number of years. In fact, your latest exhibition was in the gallery space at the Harcourt Produce and General Store, which ended on the 30th of September last year. You have stated, quote, Harcourt is my favourite place in the state to paint. The landscape around Harcourt North in particular has a unique special feel and energy to it. It's beautiful, unquote. Can you describe this unique special feel and energy that Harcourt has in more detail? Yeah, look, it's my very favourite place of Victoria. Not that I've seen all of Victoria, but, you know, something about looking up those hills, you know, uh, to the crest of the hill with those big rocks against the blue sky and, you know, sheep tracks going up through the rocks. Um, there's a real sense of like, to me, like friendly majesty to it. Mm. You know, it's, it's awe-inspiring, but not overpowering. Mm. And uh, yeah, to me, it just is a, has a real positive energy. 
and on top of that you know it goes through the four seasons and you know, I paint there a lot and I have through you know numerous seasons mm. and just to see it change is just it's yeah, it's just like seeing an old friend all the time with a different set of clothes, you know? <laughs> sure. Do you get there a few times a year to paint? Oh, a lot, a lot. Um, I have family in Bendigo still, okay. obviously, so when I drive up there, which is at least once a month, um, I try and stop and do a painting on the way and on the way back. Sure, yeah, great. Yeah, so I, one particular spot I've got, I've painted there probably 25, 30 times. Oh, wow. And you keep revisiting it and yep. find something and interesting every time. And every time. That's great. Yeah. That's great. When painting in Harcourt or in any landscape in general, how do you decide on a composition? Is there something in particular that you are looking for? So I guess I... So the way I was trained is in the uh, sort of footsteps of the Australian Impressionist, which is um, what my tutor would call responsive realism, where you look at something that uh, you have an emotional reaction to and a connection to, for us, the landscape, and, you know, in the lines of street and of then actually trying to capture something of that place and that time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I go to the landscape and I don't mind where it is, you know, I have my favourite spots and I try and, you know, get a, an a f overall impression of what strikes me. Is it the heat? Is it the colour? Is it the mood? Is it the shapes? And that starts the process of the painting. Sure, fantastic. So, you know, I guess I run through sort of keywords in a way in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the three sort of keywords that I can use to describe this, what's in front of me and how I feel about it, mm. and then I use those to drive my painting and try and hang on to those through the whole painting. Sure. Do you think that when you are out in the landscape uh, observing a particular composition, something to paint, trying to capture that, that perfect scene, that you being, being growing up, grown up in Bendigo actually influenced you in any way, the landscape around Bendigo and such? Yeah, I definitely think Bendigo is a dry, uh, dry place as well. Yeah. You know, in summer it gets hot and dry and I think, um, yeah, as much as I love the rains and I love green, it's my favourite colour, I really love the summer, the dryness, you know, and, and one of my favourite memories as a kid is out the front of our house, um, you know, we had some big tall gum trees and those cicadas just, you know, 110 degrees for two weeks straight mm -hmm. and those cicadas just going mad and, you know, that real summer heat. Mm -hmm. And, I've, yeah, I've always had a love of that. That's interesting. So you're a fan of the extreme heat? I am. I am. And that's why I feel quite, um, you know, honoured to be able to say that I could, I've painted in sort of minus 16 degrees mm -hmm. and, you know, 46 degrees and everything in between. Absolutely. And I don't mind painting in the heat at all. Sure, sure. Well, that brings me on to my next question. Ben, you are a true landscape painter, as you stated. Quote, I've painted in minus 16 degree temperatures and 46 degree heat, rain, hail and shine. I nearly got struck by lightning once. I've painted the local landscape in autumn, winter, summer and spring, and I love to sit back and note the changes in the seasons, unquote. You further stated, quote, I paint in all genres, plein air, portraiture, still life and seascapes. But I love the immediacy of plein air and just love being outdoors and capturing that, unquote. What would you say are some of the challenges of painting on plein air as opposed to being in your studio and painting? Lots. There's a lot of challenges. There's always something. In my experience of painting on plein air, there's always going to be a challenge. If it's not flies, you've forgotten, you know, your umbrella. If it's not that, uh, there's something, you know, something wants to bug you, you know, there's no perfect view, there's, you know, uncomfortable places mm. to stand, or you might get the perfect view and then you're in grass up to here and you've got to worry about snakes. There's mm -hmm. always something. Mm -hmm. But that's what I love about it, of, of going up against that challenge and being able to walk out of there with not a finished painting, but something that I'm just, I feel like I've got something of my experience in that place. And really, I guess at its essence, it's my way of being in the world, really. Absolutely, absolutely. And how do you deal with some of those challenges when you're out in the landscape? For instance, the bugs, the strong sunlight. Well, I've learned that, you know, 
not to get annoyed about it, just try and deal with it as best you can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the great tips my tutor again gave us is there's never such thing as a bad painting, like a bad field note. There's always something good about it, and that may be just the colour or maybe just the shapes you've got. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't go in there trying to, you know, with a lot of intensity trying to, I used to, trying to get a perfect studio painting. I treat it as everything is unfinished in the landscape. Sure. Um, and even though I do sell them sometimes, um, I still consider them as uh, unfinished but complete uh, paintings. Sure. But look, you just get a good system and just work that system. Get mm -hmm. a, a, a system that works for you, keep it simple, and don't try and you know, change it up too often. Mm -hmm. Sure. Good advice, Ben. When out in the landscape, Toby, your studio dog, keeps you company as you paint. In fact, Toby usually accompanies you wherever you go. You seem to have a strong connection with him. Yes, I do. I've had him for 14 years. He's a rescue dog. He's 15 on the 15th of January, so in 10 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's been everywhere with me, apart from overseas. And uh, I think he loves it as much as I do. We just love hanging out together. And, um, you know, he just often lays under the car. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't like the flies so much these days, but um, he just loves being out there as well. I mean, he's a border collie, he's mm -hmm. a farm dog. Sure. And when I very, very first moment I met him, he was laying under a trailer, so nothing's changed. <laughs> he loves, you know, doesn't mind being chained up and just loves laying under a vehicle. Fantastic. Yeah, That's great. And I just find him great company, you know. That's great. Great. Having a studio dog, uh, I suppose as artists, we spend a lot of time yeah. in the studio and it can become quite lonely at times. Yes. Having a studio dog is a, a nice way to kind of break that up a little bit. Correct. And I, th I guess some people have a bird or other people have a cat. But um, yeah, I'm a dog person. I love all animals, but I love dogs. And uh, yeah, it's just great having this um, animal hanging out with you and you can talk to. And you know, I've talked to him a lot because um, he wasn't vocal when I first got him, but you know, now he's quite a vocal dog. Sure. We have some great conversations. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. Ben. The only challenge is, he, you know, they just love being near you. So, you know, we're taught to walk back from our easels and mm. he just has a habit of standing behind you. Yeah, well, laying behind me. So, okay. yeah, yeah. So we've careful. got this thing where I just get him by the the legs and drag him out of the way <laughs> and he doesn't mind at all he's sure. just like yeah, yeah and then you know half an hour later he's back, in back the there <laughs> but that's all part of the entertainment of just you know being you know as you said in a studio by yourself because it is a long lonely process at times mm -hmm. sure throughout your life you have traveled the world three times over with your trusty plane air kit this is quite a romantic idea what would you say are some of the most beautiful places in the world that you've painted? Oh, look, Italy, Italy and Spain, mm -hmm. uh, but particularly Italy, you know, all those beautiful buildings and movement and just so, just so much stuff to paint. Mm. But whenever I travel, I always take my paints and I always paint because again, it's my way of documenting my life. I guess some people write a diary I paint on plain air, so, mm. you know, city, wherever I am. Sure. And it, in that, it's also taught me that you can take the most ordinary subject and it's really not what you're painting, it's how you paint it and sure. make it into something interesting. Mm -hmm. So do you often carry sketchbooks with you Ben, when you when you head out, I have a sketchbook with me, and I tend to do a little thumbnail sometimes, just to if I want to work out a composition, like a two to three minute sketch. But you know, when I'm travelling, now I just get straight into the paint, straight straight just into it. Prima, yep. yeah, fantastic, yep. great. There are many great books on landscape painting that have been published, which provide valuable information to the aspiring art student. What are some which you have come across in your time? Um, so Carlson's Guide yeah. to Landscape Painting, yeah. I only discovered that not that long ago and look, it's just absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. It's, been a, it's a classic book. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, these are called classics for a reason because, you know, there's lots of new books and all sorts of things coming onto mm. the market, but, you know, ultimately they all just revolve around 
it's just another way of illustrating and teaching what these classics taught. So mm. I just think that book's absolutely invaluable. It's like the Nicolaides for landscape painting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So the, the, the Carlson Guide to Landscape Painting yeah. and yeah. Uh, also the, the Kimon Nicolaides Natural Way to Draw. Correct. Two of the books you'd recommend. Yep. 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 Fantastic. Definitely. I understand you use a Bouchard box when out in the field. Have you experimented much with different plein air equipment over the years? I have, and I'm in the process of trying to develop the ultimate pochard box. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, you know what that actually what that actually looks like, and I think I've pretty much nailed it. Great. Um, but uh, you know, I'd really like to get it manufactured, but just the you know the challenges of manufacturing costs has been made a, made it prohibitive at the yes, moment. Yes, of course. But, uh, yeah. We are limited in regards to Pochard boxes in Australia. Yeah. In the yeah. States, there are many there are. fine companies that provide really great quality uh, Pochard boxes. But here in Australia, we, are, we don't have too many manufacturers that are uh, producing them. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I've really enjoyed and it's been my ongoing, uh, part of my ongoing relationship with Bob or one of the facets of it of constantly talking about, you know, what's the ideal pochard box. Sure. You know, because you've got to balance weight against holding enough of your equipment, against being, you know, uh, portable, small, uh, being able to carry wet paintings. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they all have their pros and cons and just trying to find that balance. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Bob there, is that Bob Senior? Bob Senior from Senior Art Supplies. Fantastic, the founder of, of Senior, Senior Art, Art Supplies. Supplies. Yep, so Fantastic. Bob's a really good friend of mine. He's been in the business for 54 plus years. Wow. He now has four shops in Melbourne and uh, recently opened one in Brisbane. Mm. And uh, look, I've gained uh, a lot of information and, uh, you know, grown a lot from just having Bob as a, I guess I would class him as much as a mentor as a friend. Wow, that's great, Ben. Yeah, and we've done a lot of plein air painting together. Fantastic. That's, him and I were the ones who nearly got struck by Oh, way. is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bob and I are game enough to get out in, that's what I love about him as well, he's game enough to get out in all sorts of weather. Mm -hmm. Sure. I remember on our last trip down on the peninsula, we stayed at the golf course, so him and I just went painting for four days. Okay. And uh, we were staying at the golf course there, and it started, I think, I don't know, it was three days in or something, and it started absolutely pouring rain. And Bob and I, let's go out and paint, we'll find a, a rotunda or a veranda yeah. or something. And I remember saying to him as we were driving down the driveway of the golf course, surely there'd be no golfers out in this weather, you know, only mm. the mad painters. But we'd come around the bend and here's all the golfers on the green in the pouring rain and we thought they were just as mad as we were. <laughs> we thought it was fantastic, so. That's yeah. great. He's up for anything, Bob. Yeah, sounds like a great guy. Yeah. He's um, taking a step back now from running Senior Art Supplies. It's his son, Luke, is it? Now Correct. He runs. Yep, Luke Senior runs it all and has certainly advanced the business as well, which Bob's really proud of. And, um, yeah, I think he's, he's still around to obviously offer him advice. and Sure. You know, um, but, yeah, Luke's doing an amazing job of, um, you know, having running these great uh, art supplies, which are built on not only supplying uh, top quality art materials but all the people that work there are artists in their own right sure and being able to offer information about whatever you need to know absolutely that's great yeah, yeah they're a very reputable company they senior are. art supply has been around for a long time they have absolutely now ben you were trained representationally but you've always been interested in abstraction observing your body of work your paintings often run the full spectrum from purely representational through to abstract. And I understand you are trying to develop a synthesis of the two into your own unique visual language to describe your relationship with the world around you. In fact, you believe that realism is first and foremost abstract, which I completely agree with. In your studio, you have an ongoing page series in which you regularly explore the divide between the seen and the unseen. I understand the paintings in this series are all based on a page from a book, almost like a doorway, a portal. They are abstract, but they frequently have a figurative or other representational element to help the audience enter the painting. 
You believe that the abstract components of the composition help create more mystery in your work. You are a fan of a quote from the 20th century Irish-born British painter, Francis Bacon, who stated, quote, the job of the artist is always to deepen the mystery, unquote. In fact, this quote is featured on your website. Can you elaborate on this relationship between figuration and abstraction in your work and your fascination with mystery? Sure. Uh, probably write a whole book on it as well. So that really come out of, um, you know, so obviously I drew representationally as a, as a child, but, you know, as part of some of the creative stuff I used to do was obviously collage and which is, you know, shapes. Mm. And uh, you know, I just even remember, you know, really, really young. Remember the red and blue balls that you had okay. and you poked the shapes in there? Yeah, so I was fascinated yeah. with that as well and the uh -huh. shapes. Sure. So I've always been fascinated with shapes. Not So no conscious anything about abstract. Mm. And then as I was, you know, into my 30s, I knew, of course I knew who Monet was, but my tutor would just make a few comments. And, you know, I remember one time him saying about the horizons in Monet's paintings about how if you look at the sequence the horizon gradually uh, disappears off the top of the canvas and yeah. they become fully abstract mm. and those little things just stick in my mind and it's like yeah yeah I really want to know more so very early on I'd fallen in love with Monet so on one hand I've got this love of sort of Monet's which are all, you know, like Monet's later works which are almost abstract. Here am I painting as a realist painter and it's like two ends of the spectrum. How do I actually, uh, you know, reconcile those in myself and in my own work? Mm. And that's been an ongoing journey and... Uh, you know, in the demonstration I did, you, you hear me talk about abstract shapes. So, in some ways, I'm getting a little bit more clarity. There's a long, you know, I don't think there's any end to it. Uh, that, uh, you know, the world is, as one way of seeing it, is just made up of abstract shapes. Sure. I completely agree with you. I mean, I think um, really good realism at its, at its core yes. is highly abstract. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Which has led me on a great journey to study abstract painters as well. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like all of them, but it doesn't mean that I don't go and look at what I don't like either. I mean, I think we can learn from everything and everybody. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So um, it's, just, it's just been this. And so I remember early on consciously thinking, oh, I'd love to somehow combine abstract and realist painting. Not knowing, having any idea how I could do that, but just thinking, yeah, maybe that's part of the journey. And it certainly, uh, in hindsight, has been and largely is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's interesting because in our tradition, our realist tradition, uh, abstraction and realism have been opposed in yes, the past. Yes. However, there are good things to, to take from abstraction yes. compositionally and to really understand the essence of art in an abstract uh, sense as well. And I find teaching, you know, my students something like portraiture mm. um, where, you know, they're much better off thinking in abstract state, shapes at the start of the painting than mm. trying to think features and nose and eyes and oh, shape of head. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, when they grasp that, you just see them, you know, move along really quickly because mm. that's really the fundamentals of, of the rest of the painting. Absolutely. Uh, our, our brain can trick us into thinking our nose looks a certain way or our eye looks a certain way. Yeah. We tend to draw things based on preconceptions Correct. rather than painting or drawing things as they actually appear. Correct. So if we're able to um, really break things down into a series of abstractions and tell ourselves that we're not looking at an ear or an eye or a nose yeah. but shape, line, tone, we tend to be a lot more accurate in our yes. representations. And I've found, uh, particularly over the last few years, you know, my internal dialogue as I'm painting, and I hopefully I've shared a little bit of that as I've done the demonstration, that, you know, l later and later in the painting, I'm still thinking abstract painting, almost to nearly, you know, starting off with a realist idea, but then uh, carrying that out in an abstract fashion, 
and that um, sort of moving from the abstraction to the realist as the painting uh, you know comes to a fruition that's become later and later and later mm. in the painting that's interesting isn't it yeah it is and of course so on my uh, you know self studies I came across Mondrian mm. his earlier work in particular and if you go on the internet you can look at he's one of the best to just see this amazing progression from highly representation or representational painting mm -hmm. right through to abstraction and all the steps you know those tree paintings as he's mm. taken them into fully abstract paintings yeah it's interesting so that's Monet and, and Mondrian have been a couple of them that inspired me and I remember so speaking about these page paintings um, there was one particular night where you know for some reason I just felt like I'd come to a bit of a uh, standstill with representational painting and it's just I just again had this bit of a it wasn't an aha moment but an, an inspirational moment of using something that's symbolic in the work and I did this painting um, of uh, it was actually a page mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the canvas and then a page on it, so a rectangle, right, which represented the page of a book. Mm -hmm. And this very first painting had a, a kangaroo in it, so it had a representational element sure. um, in this page. And that just sparked this whole series, and I've done a lot of them. Sure, that's interesting. Um, I've done some of them are fully abstract, but most of them have a realist element in them. You know, from a kangaroo to a Murray cod to pots. Mm to figures um, all sorts yeah. of things to get and you know so often I use the figure with that page form. sure yeah I've seen others where you've included uh, florals or correct. flower, flower. Rose, yep correct so on and so forth yeah yep. and it's interesting because the thing that does unify them all is that little window or that 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 outline well, of a page which that you see page occurring. then through the series of paintings and and is became ongoing uh, as not so much a page but it started to become this portal between like two worlds sure you know the seen and the unseen mm -hmm. you know the realist and the abstract mm -hmm. and the, the known and the unknown which is that mystery thing sure in saying that Ben you're not trying to play on the two schools as in you know abstraction versus realism in these paintings you're looking at it from more of a you're coming to it from more of a innocent uh, inquisitive uh, sort of uh, uh, area I'm it's not uh, you're not poking fun is what I'm trying to say definitely not I'm coming it's coming from an internal thing in me which is this thing of knowing that uh, just what we see isn't all about what there really is there's mm -hmm. a lot more to it sure um, you know, there's a spiritual uh, spiritual side to life mm. and uh, you know and unseen and you know things like electricity you can't see it no it's there, it's there. Yeah. you know radio waves all sorts of things absolutely um, so yeah yeah it's an exploration of that sure a personal exploration of that absolutely I understand your pages series of paintings have connected with people. Some have come up to you and explained how the paintings remind them of a certain time in their life. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and people have purchased them for that purchased purchased them for that reason. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, uh, do you find when it comes to selling your works that these pages paintings are more popular than your purely representational paintings? Yeah, yeah, it was funny. Um, you know, oh, I've done pretty well with my representational painting. I mean, obviously, people love wildlife painting, you know, when early on and, um, you know, still life and landscape. But, uh, and I thought, you know, these were painted purely for me. I had no uh, inkling about selling them or anything. Mm. And, uh, yeah, they've turned out to be more popular than the representational painting because I think, yeah, they obviously uh, connect in some way with the internal journey of a, of a person, mm. whether it is reminding them of a certain time of life or a place. And I have one lady that has four large ones in her house. There's mm. four different seasons. She wow. has one in her lounge room. She has one mm. on each wall. Mm. So she basically lives in this uh, house with, amongst others, big, four big ones. Mm -hmm. Sure. Some people would argue that with realism, you know, we do we do run the risk of being quite literal. Do you think what appeals 
uh, to people in these, these pages series uh, paintings that you've actually created is the idea that there is more than actually meets the eye yeah. or there is a sense of decoding what's going on? I think a bit of both. I think both. I think uh, there's a sense of, uh, you know, and I believe that's part of, partly the artist's job is to decode what's going on for mm -hmm. other people to see. Sure. Um, you know, mechanics, you know, tighten nuts and, you know, like, you know, fix cars. You know, artists, the job of the artist is to, A, deepen the mystery but also decode it as, you know, parallel for people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. well said, Ben. You particularly enjoy the aesthetic qualities of Charoscuro in your paintings, something which inspires you from Rembrandt. When attempting to capture a successful illusion of light and dark in your paintings, do you find you can rely on a photograph at all? It's an interesting, a good question, and uh, so I'll just, you know, honestly, I don't make any, uh, you know, don't hide the fact that I don't let my students and never have paint from photographs ever. Mm -hmm. um, or everything we do is from life. Um, I'm not averse to painting from photographs, and I use them myself, but they need to be used appropriately because they just do not capture what's out there. Sure. And again, I got that from my tutor of, you know, a real strong paint from life and then use the photograph sparingly if you need to. Mm. And it's amazing when you do that, um, you know, how, how little you need them. Mm, sure. Um, so what would, uh, what would be a situation where you would use a photograph in your painting? Yep, so he, and this is what I do, he would encourage us to, uh, or what I try and do, he would encourage us to uh, use black and white photographs. Okay. And particularly for the detail, I mean you can't naturally uh, remember all the detail. It's true. Yeah, so that's where the photograph, I think, really comes into its own. Sure. Um, but certainly for colours, uh, you can do colour studies. Um, for, you know, particular shapes, you can do studies and drawings. Mm. And uh, the tonal stuff, you can do a tonal, you know, tonal study as well. Mm -hmm. And between those, and this is what we've been doing in my advanced course uh, last year, is my students have been making a fairly large studio painting by just um, following that process of doing preliminary drawings, colour studies, black and white studies, no tan, and then using a photograph sparingly if they need it just for, you know, sometimes, you know, you want a figure and you can't actually get someone to hold that pose, you know, if you're mm. picking oranges or something. Uh, as one of my students has done. So, you know, she's used a couple of photographs just for the, get some sort of uh, movement of the figure. Sure, photographs are a good way to fill in the gaps. Correct, Abs that's how I see it. Absolutely. And have, always have, and I'm so grateful that I have, uh, you know, been encouraged to do that because uh, I think sometimes they can be overused. Mm -hmm. Sure, well said. Regarding your painting process, do you work indirectly or a la prima, or are you using a combination of both methods? I use both methods and then a combination sometimes of both methods. So out in the field, a la prima, straight up. Uh, you know, you're capturing light, there really is no time to do an underpainting. Mm. Um, but then in the studio, um, and particularly if I'm doing, say, a big still life, then I do an underpainting, and that's a long, slow, chiaroscuro process mm -hmm. um, of just mapping out that big dark and light, and that could be five or six sessions. I see. Right. At least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I, you know, gradually split up from there, mm. which is where, you know, in the demonstration, I, you know, in the explanation at the start of it, I showed, you know, the filter and the Lorraine glass, that's where they really come into their own because you've got that time to go slow and use those tools. Mm -hmm. Um, so both, I, I uh, you know, the gamut of my methods is quite uh, wide. I draw on it as necessary. Sure, and the, and the outcome will dictate the, the process that you use to get there. Again, that responsive realism of, of this letting the subject direct how you're going to portray it and, and, and what sort of method you're going to use. Sure, absolutely. You That's know, and well that said. can even, you know, technically that can even be, you know, might ask for a black and white subject, you know, black and white paint. There's mm -hmm. all sorts of, yeah, very big on letting the, uh, you're not going into it, say, 
you know, with a set idea and imposing that idea on the subject, but rather going to the subject and letting that subject speak to you and then you responding to it. Mm. And having that, it's a conversation. It's Absolutely. It's a, a synergy and, a, and an exchange of energy and there's all sorts of ways of describing that relationship. Sure. Well said. Now, you've mentioned the Claude glass or the Lorraine glass yep. before. I understand you use one when you're actually out painting landscapes. Yep. It's a handy tool which landscape painters have used throughout history for judging tonal variations and seeing the subject in a painterly quality. How exactly do you use the Claude glass in your painting practice and do you find it helpful? Absolutely, I think it's one of the vital tools I use. Uh, you know, I've trained myself pretty well tonally, so the filter I don't use as much because I can just squint mm. the same. And, um, you know, but certainly the Claude glass, the Lorraine glass, I use all the time. Sure. Um, in every painting I do, because, you know, by holding it up on your nose and looking at your subject and your canvas, it inverts that. Mm -hmm. Um, which disconnects your brain from realism and l helps you see it, everything as abstract shapes and sure. it, it, it narrows the colour, flattens the colour out and it also uh, narrows your tonal range so you can see them clearly. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, it's a very, very useful tool and I would just encourage every artist to make it. You know, it costs you $2 to make it. Yeah and I think it is one of the most useful tools. That's it's, it's correct and you also uh, run your students through how to create them Yeah, themselves. yeah, I have a, a document, free document on my website of how to make one. Absolutely, so, yeah. great Ben, fantastic. I understand you sometimes use worn out brushes when painting as well as your fingers and hands. Can you elaborate more on this particular approach to painting? Sure. So, you know, um, as I said in my uh, demonstration, I don't, you know, I keep all my brushes, have jars of worn out brushes, which, you know, if I'm modelling a face, I, don't, I wouldn't tend to use because you're getting, you know, you were looking for that beautiful roundness. But certainly if you're looking for some unusual marks or you're painting sort of the foreground of a paddock of that rugged dry grass, then you don't want a brush that's going to put down a very clean mark, unless that's what you definitely want. So those worn out brushes are ideal for that because they give these random marks that you can't get any other way. Sure. And then of course that extends to sticking your fingers in the paint and, mm. and uh, you know, like, um, you know, sm not only blending and smudging things, but, you know, I find myself even, you know, sticking my finger in the paint and putting a bit on sometimes. I don't do a lot of it because sure. I'm aware of, you know, the, the uh, toxicity of paint at times. Mm. Um, but I never forget going into uh, seeing one of Rembrandt's paintings in Amsterdam, mm. and it was a portrait of it. And the fellow had one of those coats on with all the buttons, mm. and you could clearly you could clearly see Rembrandt had just picked up a big chunk of paint on his thumb, and all the buttonholes were just thumb marks like that. Yeah, right. The face was beautifully modelled, so were the hands. But then, as the attention trickled away from those elements into the clothing which needed to be painted broadly he'd just done the buttonholes with his thumb wow fantastic mm -hmm. which would have been i imagine would have been quite controversial at that oh, time. at that time yeah it's interesting because you do have a fair bit of impasto in your, in yeah. your paint application yeah. are you experimenting with mediums or anything that may uh, allow you to keep the paint more thick when applying it to canvas i have um but oh, it's just nothing like just using straight paint and i don't mind doing that mm. um it's been a long journey of uh you know talking myself and it's interesting i just read it i can't even remember i read it the other day mm. uh probably on the internet I saw this um, a post that just said uh, paint is only wasted when it's left in the tube <laughs> and I thought yeah that is so true that's true um, yeah. yeah so you know these days I just paint in pasto with the paint Fantastic. because I'm also interested in the craft of painting mm. and I really want to make sure that uh, you know these paintings have the best chance of longevity and uh, you know the set again for that the simpler the better so, sure yeah. it's interesting I'm gonna come back to Bob senior for a moment here uh, one of the things that Bob has actually mentioned to you uh, in the past is that uh, there isn't enough 
oil paint being used here in Australia. Yep. Would you like to elaborate on that point? I've heard Bob say that so many times and I've been in uh, you know, situations where we've gone into a gallery and you've seen a beautifully impasto uh, you know, painted painting and Bob's like, oh, you know, just all over it. You could just see his face light up. And he said to me numerous times, he said, whenever I say this, most people think I say it because I own an art store. You know, and I want to sell more paint. Mm. He said that can be not further from the truth. He said, and I believe too. He says I believe that uh, you know one of the best uh, attributes of oil paint is that beautiful uh, um, uh, texture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know, so it's sort of to me. Sometimes you see paintings that are painted so thinly. I find myself going, you know, you know why wouldn't you do it in watercolour? Mm. You know. That's true. So yeah, yep. So yeah, I've heard Bob say that a lot. <laughs> you have worked with sculpture before. Throughout history, we find some artists who were only painters or sculptors, and some who work with both concurrently. Do you find the art of painting and sculpting to be quite different and can you work in both mediums or do you find one distracts you from the other? No, no, I think they complement each other. Okay. And, you know, I, I never forget my tutor coming in. Sometimes, you know, every now and again he would walk in and he'd be like, clear the tables, we're not painting today. Mm -hmm. he'd, he'd slap a big slab of clay down on the table and he'd cut it up. Wow. And he'd be like, we've got a life model coming in and you're going to sculpt the model with the clay. Mm -hmm. And he said, this will help you think three-dimensionally in your painting. And Absolutely. they were abs so valuable. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, as a child, you know, I used to play with, um, you know, like, I think it was Das back then, mm. the Das clay, mm -hmm. and make, you know, sculpture. Even as a kid, I was making sculptures as well. Mm -hmm. So I've always thought in three dimension. Um, I have no, cha no uh, challenges with, like, spatial awareness, like, um, three dimension. Sure. Um, that's just, and look, if I had the opportunity, I'd have a parallel studio to do sculpture as well. Wow. I think they help each other. Yes, absolutely. And I think what you, um, you stated there to start your answer, uh, getting painters in particular to, to sculpt is very important in helping yeah. them to comprehend yeah. form. Uh, you, nowadays, a lot of uh, academies and, and studio schools are doing a uh yeah. sculpture yeah. where students will actually go ahead and, and sculpt the muscles on top of a, a, a wire armature of a particular figure. Yeah. Um, in saying that, Ben, do you find that you're working with sculpt Sculpture more these days in order to create uh, exercises to comprehend form, or are you trying to create finished artworks in sculpture? Well, I don't have the facilities to do it, and um, you know, uh, around you know, quite a few years ago, um, and for quite a number of years, I was doing a lot of projects in schools. So mm. I was doing a lot of chainsaw sculpture. I see in right. schools. Okay. Um, you know, and I'd just do a little quick drawing in my sketchbook and mm -hmm. then I'd picture that in three dimension in my head and fire up the chainsaw and carve <laughs> it with a chainsaw. I see. Um, so I was just doing that, you know, one school I was doing that and the next school I'd be doing a mural with the kids. So, you know, just working in flat form. Yeah. Um, so I was just bouncing around all over the place when mm -hmm. I was working in schools. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the physical space to do sculpture at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but but certainly if I did, I'd be just, I'd probably be doing a lot more of it. Fantastic. That's great, Ben. Yeah. Very nice. And I don't know, you know, in another life I could fancy myself as uh, Michelangelo and a block of marble and a big hammer, you know. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible how they were able to uh, cover so many mediums and master so many yeah. mediums yeah. as well. Moving on. You seem to be quite protective of your studio time. When in the studio, you avoid distractions by turning your phone off and you won't respond to messages until the following day. Do you find it difficult to get away from the world and concentrate on painting when you are in the studio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, the, the world has, and it's getting harder with technology and, you know, sound bites and everyone's, everyone wants everything instantly. Uh, you know, it says till the next day. I mean, I'd probably leave it for a week if mm. I could. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to run a business and, 
you know, and, and do the right thing, and, and I don't mind doing it. But yeah, certainly when I'm having a run in the studio, I'm very protective of my time and energy. Good on you. Um, I, you know, there's, there's this internal thing that I engage with, and like being out in the landscape, um, you know, if I'm painting with other people in the landscape, you know, that's what I love about painting with Bob. When we're painting, we just totally don't converse. You mm. know, we're both focused on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm in my studio, um, you know, you're connecting with that. Uh, you're really trying to grasp that internal thing and make it external. And, you know, any sort of distractions can just throw you off so quickly. It's true. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. so I do. I work hard to create an environment in my studio with music and, you know, uh, things that don't distract me. And when I'm in there, yeah, because I don't want to be pulled out and then back in and pulled out because mm. I think your work becomes more shallow because of that. Absolutely. So, yeah, I am very protective. Very good. And I've learnt over the years to, you know, some people, uh, and I guess this has sometimes been the challenge with family is, you know, they sort of think they can come and go, but no, they, you know, you have to train them to understand that it's a, uh, you know, it's a, what's the word? It's a, um, a time that takes great concentration and great listening mm. and uh, yeah you need as little distractions as possible absolutely and you find you can listen to music as you're painting oh yeah yeah I find that that in particular drives the mood of my painting so okay. I have a huge range of music I have a, all sorts of love of music uh, from classical to heavy metal to blue to everything. Okay. New age, you know, like uh, newer, even some newer age music. Mm. Um, all sorts of things. That's interesting. You don't find that the music uh, tends to influence the kind of emotive response that you're trying to achieve in the painting? Yes, and I use it for that. For, for that, that particular abs absolutely. advantage? Absolutely, yes I do. And sometimes I put music on, it's like, no, that's not right, and I'll just put something else on. Okay. And then often, uh, or uh, quite often, um, some of the lyrics um, end up as titles. Uh, I use snippet out of the lyrics as titles right? of my painting. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I think there's more than two or three paintings that have, um, oh, I've got a brain blank now. Mm. What's the good Aussie band? ACDC. No, 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 no. It'll come back to me. Sure. No worries. We'll move on in that case. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of the name of them now. In the past, you have explained that the love and joy of painting is what drives you and is what keeps you coming back to it. Do you find you can paint every day or is it too taxing on your mind and body? It's been a long time since I've painted every day for a long period. I mean, because, you know, my life's quite centred around teaching and, um, you know, running that uh, side of things. But when I get a good run, yeah, eventually I think you run out. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Julia Cameron, The mm. Artist Way. Mm. And she talks about how, you know, at some point you've got to fill the well because when you're creating, you're drawing out of this internal well and it will run dry. That's right. And I've found that. So, you know, she's very encouraging about going out into the world and doing something. So, yeah, sometimes I think after a period of time, yeah, I just want to just put the brushes down. And that's where I love going outside, gardening. Mm -hmm. going you know I have an interest in cars mm -hmm. I fix my own cars because I really like using my hands sure I'm mechanically minded mm. and um, you know after a long period of painting it's just really nice to just put the brushes down not go into the studio and do some really practical stuff sure you know painting a house or um, you know a new garden bed or fixing you know something that's rattling mm. So nowadays, what's a long break for you from painting? How many days would it be? Oh, well, it's more measuring the other way of how many days I can get to paint. And oh, I, I see. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've just had quite a few days back-to-back -back painting over Christmas, which has been fantastic. I haven't had that for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been in the studio a lot. And uh, I just forget how it just makes my life make sense. Mm -hmm. Sure. Are you a morning painter or do you paint late at night? Uh, I love getting up in the morning, but it's not my natural, like early in the morning, but mm. it's not my natural bent. 
Sure. Um, but I love the evening, like the late evening light as well, but mm -hmm. I can paint well into the night. I don't tend to because I like to, if I can, mostly paint from natural light. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. After your training with Lance McNeil, I understand you started teaching classes and workshops on your own. You have a passion for passing on your knowledge to those who attend your classes and workshops. With your teaching, you seek to ground students solidly in the traditions of observational drawing and painting with an informed use of quality materials. Can you explain how you initially got started teaching and how you developed a curriculum for your students? Yeah. When I had my first exhibition in Bendigo, um, I was my son was going to a primary school there and I met the art teacher, obviously, and uh, she brought her class, his class, to the exhibition and then she said, will you run a workshop? And I'm like, mm. I don't know, I don't know how to do that. I've never <laughs> done anything like that before. She's like, you just set up some tables, set up some tables in the middle, um, just find something and tell the kids how to, show the kids how to draw it. Mm. So I've got a few stuffed animals, I've got a beautiful stuffed duck, and I took the duck in there, which they were fascinated with, mm. and we just drew ducks. Oh, great. And that was my introduction to classes, and I really um, enjoyed being able to pass on what I knew to mm. these children. That's great. And that sparked my whole career of working in primary schools um, for quite some years mm. um, as parallel to my own painting practice. Mm. Um, but then again, with my relationship with Bob of you know many, many conversations of him talking about you know his noticing of the um, the craft of painting being, you know, lost mm. or, you know, gradually uh, dissipating. Mm -hmm. um, the understanding of, you know, how to use oil paint, the materials, what the brushes are for, you know, what each brush is for, how it works, how they're made, um, you know, the fat over lean principle with sure. oils. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, as the more I talked to him about it and learned from him and did my own research, the more I realised I just, yeah, I have this real interest in understanding the craft of oil painting. Absolutely, very well said. So Ben, you mentioned your work in schools and in, in public and private uh, schools yeah. over the years. Were you working just as a visiting artist? In I was, I was. I sort of developed this reputation where um, I could basically rock up to a number, of, a lot of schools. Um, some of them, a couple of them actually wrote me into their budget for a number of years. Okay. And at one particular time, the government was, um, um, they were finding that there was uh, a lot of particularly boys had no really no male role model in their lives that's right and there was uh, I think it was around about 2012 and there was quite a bit of money coming from the government to bring males into schools mm -hmm. Um, so I was going in there, they were getting me in there to do these art projects where I was just working with boys in particular um, and, and uh, working with tool, hand tools in that. We did quite a few limestone sculpture projects. Okay. Um, where I'd, I'd, you know, we'd get a pallet of limestone shipped over from uh, South Australia mm. and I'd cut all the blocks up into, you know, there might be 300 kids in the school and I'd cut it up into 300 little blocks mm -hmm. and then I'd do some big carvings and, and they came out in groups and carved all their own little carvings and sure. then we'd have this whole sculpture exhibition. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, which was just as much about making the, paint, the, the um, artworks as it was about, um, you know, just talking to these boys and giving them a you know uh, some sort of role model great that's fantastic yeah very yeah. nice Ben great you usually begin your classes with a quote from a famous artist is that correct correct I still try and do that mm-hmm yep and do you discuss the quote or is it just you stay state the quote and get stuck into your no teaching? no I try and discuss you know um, unpick what they're trying to say because um, sometimes they can be a little bit uh, cryptic purposely mm, yeah. um, you know to make you think and uh, yeah, every now and again, we have a private Facebook group for my um, uh, one year oil painting course. Mm -hmm. And I often put quotes in there just sure. to make my students think. If okay. I come across something that's really, I think is really worth thinking about, mm -hmm. I'll just post it in there. Great, fantastic. Yeah. You have a particular love for teaching life drawing, as you have stated, quote, life drawing is a little like scales for pianist. 
It includes all the key aspects of art like line, form, light, shape and shade. It also encourages self-discipline as you only have a limited time to create something." Unquote. Indeed, life drawing is a staple in an artist's training. When teaching life drawing, do you follow a certain methodology such as sight size, comparative measurement, gestural drawing or block in? It's interesting. So, uh, you know, often the academies come from uh, very much a sight size uh, practice, mm. which I love as well. Um, but then I think often they can miss out on the gesture, like the Nicolaitis side of yeah. it. Um, which, you know, which was uh, my particular training around, you know, uh, gesture, contour, cross contour, uh, volume. Mm. So um, I've sort of developed my own program of using both of them. Okay. You know, like combining bug plates yes. with the Nicolaitis gesture. Yes, great. Um, so trying to draw on the best of both worlds and create something that gives you uh, um, a, a, a drawing or a painting that's not static, that's got mm. movement, gesture, mm -hmm. but then has all the beautiful structure of the academic side of it. It's important and it, it does yeah. make sense. I mean, the bog plates are I mean, notoriously take a very, very long yes. time to complete. Yes. And that's a, a appealing to a different side of training. It is. You know, if you were to try to capture something uh, when out in, in the field with great speed, working from a bog drawing or that kind of process of working slow and methodically isn't always going to work. Correct. You do, you do need to be, um, you know, you do need to have your gesture down pretty well as well. And that's where the, the Kimo Nicolides natural way to draw can come into it. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I have, you know, I have worked at times with people who have tried to take, you know, one method and, and use it in another field and, and seen them very frustrated. So. I think it's just been a natural progression for me to just try and draw on best of both worlds to make you know my students uh, not so much the job easier but uh, less frustrating and be able to find their way through and at the end of it you know come up with something that is accurate but full of life. Well said, absolutely. I understand you have a very popular artist retreat to King Valley every summer and winter. In fact, due to popularity, you are now having one in autumn too. How did you initially get started with the artist retreats? Well, again, with the artist retreats in King Valley, Victoria, um, I went there, you know, as I was studying with Lance McNeil, he was running retreats from the very same place. Yes. And, uh, you know, I went to a few of them. They were absolutely fantastic. And he was very big on... Uh, Yes, it was very much about the learning and the painting, but just as much about the artistic camaraderie, which is important. Because, Absolutely. you know, in our everyday lives, often we're all just by ourselves doing our work. Mm -hmm. But then coming together for five days of just, you know, being able to hang out on couches and talk about the day of painting and mm -hmm. develop, you know, amazing relationships, you know, friendships that last a lifetime. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, with a whole bunch of people that all have the same passion, it's just inspiring whichever field you're in. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, about a bit seven years ago now um, I just thought yep we need something like that so I made inquiries the place was still running and here we are running them again <laughs> so great. I'm in the place where I used to go and study um, the tree I've seen my tutor demonstrate this big is now this big <laughs> um, you know it's amazing that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have three there a year now. Very nice. And it's very nice that you're continuing in that lineage of your, your, your tutor by, by continuing going to King Valley painting away. Yeah. Um, you're definitely keeping that tradition of, of, of landscape it's painting. It's funny. Alive. It wasn't intentional. It's just all evolved uh, over time. Yeah. Accord, you know. That's great. Yeah. Do your students meet you there or how do you all get there? Yep, yep. So we all meet there with our cars because we do go off-site occasionally. We go up to Powers Lookout generally on a Saturday, okay. um, which is just across the valley. And you can look right across for hundreds of kilometres across those mountain ranges. And often I do a demonstration around aerial perspective up there okay right because um, you've got you know plane after plane after plane yeah. you know going right up to the sky mm. and that's just a perfect place to demonstrate aerial perspective sure 
Um, we, we spend all day up there. We have a fire, apart from the summer. We have a barbecue, you know, and a glass of wine. And, and often we watch the sun go down, which is absolutely amazing as amazing. well. Amazing, beautiful. Yeah. So with your retreats, usually you're painting, uh, is it during the day and then at night, yep. you kind of just converse and discuss painting. Correct. And, and techniques, materials, so on and so forth. Yes, so we have a free paint before breakfast, which is optional. You know, you can sleep in, do what you like. So we just all, sometimes we just nominated a place the day before mm. and we go out at seven and then we're back for breakfast and then we have the formal tuition so often I do a demonstration out in the field and mm -hmm. then um, people we paint and then about halfway through the five days you know when everyone's got a few paintings going we then have a critique okay um, and then we go back out again and you know concentrate on our weaknesses and um, you know and uh, celebrate our strengths and continue on that's fantastic. And we put up a big backdrop and we hang the paintings. And, you know, when we have 20 people there, we have 250 something <laughs> plus paintings. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. Amazing. It is. And I think there is, it is so important to have that uh, yeah. community yes. of, of artists around you because yes. there is only so far we can go on our, our, our own. Sure. And we do get to a point where we do stop improving our craft on our own. So collaborating with other individuals yes. can help elevate your work take you to that next step yeah so you know the the uh the paintings are all up on the wall mm. you know we've had dinner so we're all hanging out on the couches mm. you know some some of us go to bed early you know if you're exhausted or not but you know it's nice to hang out on the couch and discuss your painting versus other people's paintings and, mm -hmm. and what they saw it's it's such a it's like looking at art books it's it's yeah. one of the prime ways to learn is to look at other paintings and that, absolutely that is often just your fellow painter absolutely well said yeah. well said ben now moving on once the covert pandemic hit your teaching was greatly impacted all face-to-face -face classes, workshops, and retreats were cancelled. I understand you invested in some cameras and started to teach online via Zoom. During the lockdowns, you worked on establishing an online art academy and you developed a year-long painting course, which today has artists from all over Australia enrolled in. Can you explain how you dealt with the challenges of transitioning from face-to-face -face teaching to teaching online and what the ultimate goal is for your online art academy. Yeah, well, I think I'm not the only person that, uh, you know, would, uh, cares to admit that COVID was a real challenge <laughs> and, uh, and a challenge that happened in a very short space of time. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, in so many fields and personal areas of people's lives. So, yeah, I lost basically all my work overnight. You know, all the art societies closed down, mm -hmm. as, as you know. Mm. And uh, it was like, well, you know, what am I going to do? And I had a, always had an idea of having some sort of academy, not knowing what it looked like. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I scrambled, got some cameras, educated myself in Zoom. And, uh, yeah, went on this amazing, le steep learning curve of how to manage cameras and put people on mute. <laughs> <laughs> You know, all those challenges of, yeah. of communicating through the screen. But mm -hmm. it has been absolutely fantastic because, you know, I've been able to reach people all around Australia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, if it wasn't for that, and I think, you know, in many, many fields, people would say the same. If it wasn't for the online and COVID, it's really been a lifesaver. Absolutely, it has. So yeah, look, lots of challenges of how to handle the camera angles, you know, how to tweak things, you know, so so it made more sense because you're not actually there putting the brush to canvas. Mm. Um, but what I did was um, I thought, well, yep, this is a good chance to f revamp my website and, uh, you know, found, uh, write some sort of one-year course because what's been leading up to that was students coming to me and saying, look, I love your classes, weekly classes, but it's not enough. Is there some sort of linear course we can do? Mm. And I'm like, well, not that I know of. Mm. Um, so I had this idea about writing a one-year oil painting course mm -hmm. um, because I think my personal opinion is that I don't, you know, Australia is quite a unique uh, culture mm -hmm. and I don't think you can just take the academic system and just plonk it in Australia and expect it to work. It's very different, you know yeah. what I mean? How do you make those two things work? How do you meld them? Mm. 
Um, so I just thought I'd try and come up with something that had elements of that. So my course incorporates the nickel 80s, mm -hmm. but we also do barg plates, mm -hmm. uh, drawing, black and white painting, and then moving on to colour and then master copies I over see. the year. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it's an academy really online, but mm. it's a one year oil painting course. And then out of that, um, so last year I then continued on and we, I ran a, and I wrote an advanced course. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Yep. So that's for students that finished that initial one year course. Correct. So then they went on to make their own studio paintings using, you know, all the, you know, all the things I've just described before about the, you know, preliminary drawings, color notes. Sure. Um, and we're going to have an exhibition at Agra uh, next month. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And how long does your advanced course go for? Is it so a year? So it's for the whole year. So it's two years altogether. Yep. Well, now we've got a third year happening this year, which great. is a mentoring course. I see. Um, so in this, the, the real focus of this course is the students actually get to pick their own projects and self-drive them and I become a mentor. Oh, fantastic. As opposed to actually teaching them and, and being the leader, they're the driver of the projects. We still have the set days and everything mm. and we still have the online gallery. We have a student gallery and do critiques from that. Sure. But they're actually choosing and driving the projects. Mm. And one of the uh, requirements is that they pick some sort of exhibiting um, uh, opportunity mm. and they work for that. Sure, fantastic. And a number of them are actually working for the 2024 Alice Bale. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. You, yeah. you, you got them onto that quite early. Well, that comes full circle to mm. what Bob Senior's always had this vision of taking young people as early as he can get them, and he shared this with me numerous times, of taking them as early as he can get them, educating them in good art materials, helping them learn to paint well and then actually getting them to win the Alice Bale. That's, That's been his, his um, passion. Fantastic. So he sort of in, um, you know, instilled that in me and I've sort of uh, been instrumental in making some of that actually happen. Sure, very well. Now Ben, you, you, you mentioned that your painting uh, course, your year-long painting course, has uh, currently got students from all over Australia yes. enrolled. How about internationally? Have you had much success? I haven't as of yet, no. Okay. No. Is that something you'd like to achieve in the future? It would be good, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it would be good. Um, there are so many great opportunities around the world. I mean, it'd be interesting, you know, obviously uh, people, yeah, I mean, people come to different tutors for different reasons and mm. it'd be interesting to see if any international people, you know, could benefit from what I'm doing. I Absolutely. Don't know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But it's, it's paralleled with free paint outs. We have a paint out once a month, which mm -hmm. is open to anybody. They're on my website. Anyone sure. can come along, mm -hmm. um, no matter how uh, experienced or inexperienced. Mm -hmm. um, so while the course is directed towards landscape, we do, you know, a lot of us go to the paint outs and do a lot of landscape. That's great. Well. Are the paint outs free? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Fantastic. Yep. You don't have to tell anyone you're coming. You just turn up and paint. Beautiful. Sounds great. Yeah, we've even had, so talking about internationally, we've mm. had a lady from California turn up. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, incredible. She was in Melbourne for four days. She did a two day sculptor course and she thought she'd like to do some plein air painting. And she Googled me, uh, Googled plein air painting Melbourne. I come up as the first one and she turned up at our paint out. That's incredible. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah. So we were quite thrilled. Good, good. It's a good way for you to make connections as yeah. well, international connections. Yeah. You are an artist who has been quite successful in winning art prizes. Perhaps the most prestigious prize you have won to date is the AME Bale Travelling Scholarship and Art Prize valued at $50,000 which you were awarded in 2016. You were one of 160 contenders in the prize. Did winning the prize come as a complete shock to you? Yeah, I was dumbfounded. I was dumbfounded because... Um I actually tried to uh, enter it in 2014, and uh, look, I um, yeah, I didn't have my Australian citizenship. Mm -hmm. I'd been in Australia most of my life, but it's sort of like um, you know, it's a long story. But it's like you know, I hadn't really had any real drive to get my Australian citizenship, and I found out at the last minute that you had to. The only requirement was you had to be an Australian citizen. 
Okay, yes, so, that's right. So yeah. I got my citizenship and I had the two years and re, uh, you know, um, applied for it in 2016. So no, I didn't think I was going to win it. I, you know, knew I knew the standard that was there and I thought, you know, I, I knew that the uh, Julian Ashton School were entering often and they were often winners of it. Mm. And, uh, you know, a great high standard. I didn't think... Um, you know, I, I was just thrilled to be selected. Mm. And so, yeah, it was a real surprise. That's great. Yeah. And uh, when you were announced, I mean, how did that come to be? How did it play out? Oh, well, of course, uh, they rang me and uh, I just nearly fell out of the car. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, really? I don't know. I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of a sudden this massive opportunity opened because, uh, you know, obviously as part of it, you, you you are required to write a proposal. Yes. And, my, you know, and the money is uh, has to be spent overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I already written my proposal about travelling to Europe, and um, all of a sudden it's like, yep, this is a goer. Mm -hmm. Up until then, it was like, you know, oh, I'm just doing this because it's part of the requirement, and I can't see this, you know, happening this time. Yeah. So there I was. Yeah, it That's was great. amazing. That's great. So it's interesting. You 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 intended to to apply in 2014. Yeah. But you had those two years to play with. So you were creating those paintings. In, keeping in mind that you wanted to enter them into the yep, Amy Bell I painted, I used those two years, and I did other th other paintings, but I, I had at the forefront of my practice of making my four pieces. So I did fairly large yeah, works. Yeah, recall. And uh, yeah, yep, used a lot of paint. Absolutely. And, uh, learned yeah. a lot of things, and uh, yeah. Yeah. It was really something. I, I do recall 2016 and, and, and uh, visiting the Amy Bale uh, Scholarship and Art Prize exhibition of finalist works and seeing your works there, uh, it definitely, they did stand out and I could see why you were selected as, as the winner. There were some pretty impressive paintings, I must say. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah, look, I, every time I think about it, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, amazing. It was a real, uh, you know, defining moment in my life as well. Oh, yeah, it would be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Winning the prize enabled you to train throughout Europe for four months in 2017. I understand you spent time studying at the prestigious Florence Academy of Art and the Russian Florence Classical Art Academy. What was your impression of these schools and what did your training there involve? F impression, fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah, look, I know we've got uh, growing academies here in Australia, but I'm sort of jealous at times of what they have over there in Europe and America. It's amazing, you know, it these, these fantastic buildings with everything, you know, the easels, the studio spaces, the student lounges, library, the cast rooms, mm. and then access to these amazing tutors that are just passionate about, um, you know, the pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. Um, so it wasn't interesting particularly just going to one academy because in my proposal, um, what I wanted to do was actually go and do some study and bring back what I learned over here in Australia. Yeah. Again, you know, adding to that academic uh, process because mm -hmm. I hadn't experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having my training being much more informal. So, um, yeah, it was just fantastic. So I spent two weeks at the Florence Academy mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, really had some interesting conversations with my tutor. Um, yeah, uh, Eurobetic. Oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. He was fantastic, and uh, yeah, we had some good conversations. That's great. Yeah. So, what what were you enrolled in? Just a two week workshop? Yeah. Uh, uh, no. So it was one week of portraiture and one week of figure painting. Okay. Yep. So one week on one portrait. Yeah. And one week on a figure, and that was sight size. Sight size. Okay. Yep. And just you know everything from the professionality of the models. Mm. Um, to the, um, uh, you know, just the explanation of, you know, the, the demonstrations Jura gave us. Um, I really liked the, look, don't get me wrong, and I'm, as, I'm like everyone else, you know, as Aussies, we're, we're very, very laid back. Yes. Aussies, yeah. you know, we're so laid back yeah. at times. 
I really liked the uh, the structured sort of, you know, the silence when you were there painting. Mm. There was the silence, you know, and you know there wasn't the banter, you know, you get at times in class and mm. stuff. And and the models were up there literally; they timed themselves, and they were back up on the dais, you know, as soon as the timer went off, and they expected you to be painting. Yeah, right. You know, it was just tight and professional, and often I think uh, sometimes. Yeah, I think that's a better way to go absolutely, sometimes. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So yes. yeah, it's again trying to find that balance between, you know, our, you know, great laid back attitude of Aussies, but then having the structure around it as well. Mm. So I really enjoyed that. And so you had only one teacher for uh, the so time I had Yura you and his partner who's Australian. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. So she did a demonstration. She painted along with us mm. and uh, you know, he, he would call us over and actually Actually, she would talk to us about different stages of the painting. What was her name, or what is her name? Oh, what is her name? I can't think of her name. It may come to you as we as we continue talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from the Florence Academy of Art, you went to another academy in Florence, which is based on more of the Russian tradition. Yep. So uh, so over the last, uh, you know. 10 years I've, I've had a real developed a real interest and a real admiration for the Russian tradition mm. I think they're the best painters in the world or some of yeah and uh, yeah you know just absolutely amazing so I wanted to go there and experience their take on it all as well yeah which was the same but different mm. um, and just fantastic um, uh, yeah yeah were the, were the instructors there could they speak English or were they speak in Russian? Uh, so the instructors were Russian and mm. then there was a translator there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which was really interesting and absolutely fabulous. I mean, I just love listening to other languages even yeah. though I can't understand them. Sure. So that was a whole other thing in itself. And um, how long were you in the, the Russian Academy for? So it was more just going and visit, visiting them and just talking to them, not so much studying there. Okay, so you're just yeah. having a chat. Yeah. yeah. Did you notice that the size of the drawings in the particular academy are quite large? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I did. Okay, yeah, they do work quite large in the Russian they do. academic They're, tradition. There's a lot of bravery there. Mm -hmm. And when you go to, um, you know, I'm just trying to think one of the galleries I went to, uh, what's the one opposite, diagonally opposite the... Um, the uh, Prado. Um, some of the, you know, you go into a, a famous gallery and you see some of the Russian paintings, they're often the biggest paintings. You yeah. Know, multi figure paintings. Impressive. Um, absolutely amazing. Mm. I don't, you know, sometimes I sort of wonder why they don't, uh, you know, as well known as they are. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. They aren't as well known. I mean, you'd discover yeah. a Russian master and it would be. You know some of the best drawings and paintings you've ever seen. I agree. You've never heard of the person before. I agree. So in the in the um, the Russian Academy, even though you were just there for a, a very brief time visiting, did you pick up on some things that were different to say what the Florence Academy of Art were doing? Yeah, I think uh, without how do, how do I put this? The Florence Academy has quite a methodical way of approaching things, mm. um, whereas the Russians, yeah, so I think they, uh, their response to the immediacy of life, sort of say colour-wise, is, is a bit broader. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, they have a different colour palette. The Florence Academy has quite a particular colour palette. Yeah. Um, whereas they, theirs is different and it's more open and, and, and more open to being, you know, different choices in that. Sure. Um, I found there, you know, one of the things that really impressed me with the, the Russian Academy is um, when I was there, the students were doing, and this is partly where I got my inspiration for doing these studio paintings, they were doing bigger paintings and they were creating these amazing storyboards with all their preparatory drawings and mm, studies mm. and some of them were in watercolour, gouache, pencil drawings building up this whole idea to translate into a big painting. Wow. And that sort of didn't really see that in the Florence Academy because it's more about painting from life in your studio or painting from the figure. Mm -hmm. They weren't actually... So I guess the Russian tradition has, you know, because um, 
the particular exhibition that was around the walls as well mm. was uh, to do with, uh, I think, a lot of biblical stories. Mm. Um, so while they were painting from life, there was much more of an idea behind the actual paint, the figurative sure. painting. So they weren't purely uh, academic studies? Correct. Yeah. They were much more about a story, a narrative, whether that's drawn from the Bible, from Greek mythology or wherever it was drawn from. Sure. Fascinating. Who were some of the artists and teachers you met while in the Florence Academy and Russian Florence Academy? So obviously Eurobetic was my tutor in the Florence Academy and he was fantastic. You know, he'd drag us all out for a coffee at uh, the break time and um, yeah, and have a bit of a chat and uh, back into work. You know, he's very friendly outside of, you know, during the break time, but as a tutor, absolutely fantastic. You know, mm. just very clear, very patient, um, but also challenging as well. And uh, yeah, I remember one particular time where there's one part of the painting of the figure I couldn't make work. I think it was the top of her head and trying to get it to turn. Mm. And he's like, look, you've just, you know, this is a challenge. You've got to come up with a way of solving yourself. Mm. And, uh, you know, we had a bit of a discussion about how uh, different ways of, of approaching that. But ultimately he left it up to me because he saw that, you know, as a painter, that is one of the primary things you do as a painter is solve problems. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so yeah, I just have a lot of respect for him, and um, you know, I still follow him on Instagram, mm -hmm. and uh, really like to see what he's doing. Great. Did you come across Daniel Graves at all? I didn't, but I heard about him. Apparently, yep. So that by then um, they had two campuses. Yes. And uh, we were at the old campus, and um, yeah, apparently occasionally he'd wander in and just mm -hmm. sort of he seemed. Uh, the way he was described, not that we talked about him much, but it was just like this enigmatic figure that would come in and sort of <laughs> talk about their pain, you know, maybe give them a bit of a critique or whatever. Sure. But, Great. Yeah, I was keen to meet him, but no, I mean, obviously he's a very busy man and it didn't happen. So. Sure, sure. And in the, the Florence, uh, the Russian Academy, Yep. did so you, um, were you aware of any of the teachers? Or oh, so Na Nadia, who was, is the director, um, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so so she's uh, fantastic, um, and uh, what's the name of our? My apologies, names. That's okay. Names aren't my thing. No um, worries. Yeah, the Russian, uh, the Russian instructor. She was absolutely fantastic. Great. Um, and yeah, as as previously mentioned, taught in Russian. Mm. And in your uh, student cohort, whilst in the Florence Academy uh, of Art, did you uh, come across any painters from other parts of the world that were studying with you? Yeah, yeah, a couple of Aussies there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So we're still friends with um, um, them on Facebook. And sure. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. care to share their names? Again, I'd have to look at my Facebook page sure. to, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I can't remember their names. But it's great there were Australians there with you. In, yeah, in yeah. And there are a fair few now who have gone over and, and have actually completed the, uh, the three-year full-time yes. core program there, which, yes. is, which is great to see. Yes. Now, you also had the opportunity of studying in other countries around Europe during your scholarship. Can you outline your course of training and some of the key lessons you took away from your time training in these countries? Well, actually, I had a, uh, another a drawing course lined up in um, uh, Amst uh, Holland. In Holland, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And again, oh, the name of the tutor escapes me, but mm. um, apparently there was a whole scam around it and the money. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the whole thing fell apart at the last minute. Okay. Um, we managed to get out. He managed to get most of the money back for us. But yeah, that I was really disappointed it didn't go ahead. Yeah, would have been a great opportunity. So that was going to be my other study in Europe. And um, but ultimately, um, when I talk about it as a study trip, and this is a, my philosophy, which hasn't actively been taught to me it's just something that I guess comes naturally is of just being open to being to learning from anything whether it's going to a gallery and looking at a painting 
whether it's seeing someone painting on plain air in the street and going up and talking to them and seeing what they're doing. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, if you go to the Duomo in Florence, there's all those uh, artists working there, yeah. in the, you know, in the square there. And, you know, just learning from them. So mm -hmm. I consider myself to be, when I was on this trip in particular, every moment of the day I was a student of my practice. That's a great way to approach it. Absolutely. Yeah. Just be a sponge. And not even just, just during the, the painting, you know, even the meals. And this was the beauty of the Alice Bale and having the money was being able to, um, you know, experience the food. Mm. Um, you know, some of the, the experiences, you know, different experiences mm -hmm. um, and particularly the gallery experiences. So I was sure. just an ongoing student mm -hmm. of my craft and the, uh, you know, really the centre of representational painting. Right, absolutely. So where were the other countries that you went to? You went to Italy. Yep, so I went to Italy. I went to Spain, which is where I discovered Soroya. Yes, of course. Yes, and his studio. I went to Amsterdam, mm -hmm. Rembrandt Studio. I went to Germany because I had a sister there and went to see uh, Kathy Kollowitz. I didn't oh, realize wow. that uh, actually her studio was there in Berlin. Sure. And a uh, big fan of Kathy Kollowitz, so that was a real uh, great um, surprise experience. Mm -hmm. And I went to the UK. Oh, great. The, you know, the portrait gallery, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the two art schools or academies that you visited were the Florence Academy of Art where you studied for two weeks. Correct. And then the, the Russian Florence Academy as well. Correct. Okay, fantastic. Correct. Very nice. Have you found that winning the Amy Bale Art Prize has brought you more attention as an Australian painter? I think it has. Um, yeah, people mention it often, you know. Um, you know, people obviously go and read your bio and um, yeah, they do mention it. Um, it's not as well known as I'd like it to be. It isn't, that's true. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm always pleased when someone says, oh, I see you won the Alice Bale. Mm. Um, yeah, because, you know, I come from, as you know, from Bendigo, and she, you know, has quite a few works in the Castlemaine Gallery. That's right. And Peter Perry's the, wrote the definitive book about her. Mm -hmm. So I sort of feel like I have a bit of an affinity with her, being yeah. a bit close to, and, and seeing her works a lot. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, so yeah, I think so. Absolutely, and it's an incredible achievement. So it is. Uh, congratulations once again on, on winning that. And Thank you very having much. Having that on your, on your CV now. Thank you. Also in 2016, you won the Victorian Artist Society Mavis Little Artist of the Year Award, which was valued at $10,000. You faced 32 other artists and ended up winning. Did winning this award come as a surprise to you? Yeah, it did. Well, there was a double whammy. It was two, two and they were very year. close <laughs> together as well. It's just like, yeah, yeah, what am I going to do with all this money? <laughs> um, it was amazing. Yeah. Again, I didn't, it was a real surprise and mm -hmm. a real honour, you know, because I was amongst, you know, people like Julian and, mm. you know, Mary and. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was a real honour. I couldn't believe it either. Was that announced uh, on the opening night, or did they call you? How did they announce it to you? Uh, no, they called. They called, they called as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Have you found that winning the Victorian Art Society Artist of the Year Award has brought you more recognition at all? Yeah. Again, um, so particularly people who are affiliated with VAS, Victorian Art Society. Um, yeah. They're like, oh yeah, I know you won the artist. Of the, you're an artist of the year, and that's great. You know, that's a real honour as well. So fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Moving on, Ben. I understand you are a Michael Harding Paints Ambassador, and you have released your own set of Australian Greys. How did you initially get the position as ambassador for Michael Harding Paints? So again, with my ongoing relationship with Bob Senior, and you know, um, Seniors being you know the the um, you know stocking Michael Harding Paints, mm. being one of the primary stockists, um, and Bob you know encouraging me to use good materials over the years, um, I just find they're fabulous, absolutely fabulous paint. 
Mm. I think paints have got to have you know certain characteristics. You know, one of them being the uh, quality of the pigments needs to be consistent through the whole colour range. Because mm. some brands, you know, it's up and down. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, so that's what I find with Michael Harding. The the quality of the colours is consistent through the range, and then that range is very affordable as well. Sure. Um, and they're absolutely beautiful to use, as we saw today in the demonstration. Mm -hmm. How did you come to get the position as ambassador? So, of course, shopping at Senior Arts, you know, I always go in there and chat to the staff and, you know, whether it's Ollie stretching canvases at Malvern or Lisa, you know, working, you know, behind the counter at... Um, uh, the Are Grave you, Street? Is uh, it? No, no, no. Um, Eaglemont, which Eaglemont. used to be Bulleen. Mm. Right, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And got chatting, and, um, you know, they're working with Michael Harding, and Michael Harding was, you know, um, I don't know the whole process whether he was actively looking, but uh, was, you know, um, happy to take on some people, and there wasn't many, there isn't many in Australia, mm. um, ambassadors for his paint. Mm hmm. And uh, Lisa was instrumental in actually um, getting a couple of people in Australia. Mm -hmm. Sure. So she just questioned you whether you would like to. She did. Be an she said, "Do you want to be an ambassador?" And I said, "Absolutely," because she knew that I used a lot of it mm. and uh, knew that I really, really liked it, and that was my, you know, go-to paint. Sure. Um, and I said, "Yeah, sure." And then she said, "Well, you know, inform me that." as part then that we had to then that application had to be put to michael harding obviously sure yeah um and then you know i was accepted which i was really thrilled about mm. and um then as part of that we get to release our own color set that's fantastic yeah what a privilege absolutely absolutely have you had much contact with Michael Harding himself? Uh, yeah, on and on, uh, a little bit, yeah, yeah. I mean, he has a, a, a big team and mm. he's a busy man as well. Yeah. Um, it was fantastic when he came out a few years ago and ran a work materials workshop at Seniors. Mm -hmm. Got to ask him some really good questions. Mm -hmm. Heard some really good stuff, you know. Got an insight into King's Blue and, you know, mm. there's questions about, you know, flat lead white and mm. all those great questions you can ask a colour man. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great man. And yeah, Michael Harding. You are also an ambassador for Neef Brushes and you have released your own line of brushes, namely the 95 Ben Winspear Stiff Synthetic Rigger in sizes 6, 8, 10 and 12. How did you become the ambassador for Neef Brushes? Well, again, that was just an ongoing thing with Bob Senior. Um, you know, I, for years, have used a quality materials and I find Neef blushes absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want a brush that does everything it can do, needs to do, and then hold its shape and, uh, you know, last a long time and still be affordable, which is the Neef range. Sure. Sure. And uh, then got talking to Bob and saying, look, you know, there's a bit of a, a gap in the market here with riggers. Okay. Uh, there's plenty of riggers for watercolour. Yes. They're too soft for oil painting. Yep. Um, and talking to Mark in at Malvern, you mm. know, we're talking about the fat over lean principle of how, you know, having to use, say, a watercolour rigger to get some of those last marks in an oil painting mm. the tendency is to thin the paint down too much which is then you're breaking the rules mm. you know you're going back to too much medium that's right um so i said we need something stiffer long handle so uh, bob and i got our heads together um he got they got some samples made mm. we road tested them mm -hmm. um, bob road tested them you know i tested them he tested them himself as well um, and we come up we came up with that. That's great. Yeah, fantastic And we've got a two and a four coming and a two and a four coming as yeah. well. Yeah, fantastic Yep, so it'll be the full range great. How long did that process actually take of developing the riggers? Oh Would be over Good six eight months. Sure. Yeah, so by the time you know we get the um, Prototypes made overseas. They're sent here. We test them uh, come to a decision they're sent back then they're actually manufactured come back here that's incredible yeah 
Yeah. Ben, it must be incredible to uh, you know walk into an art supply store and to find a set of Michael Harding paints with your name on it, or yeah. Neef brushes, you know your own signature series. I mean, what's that like? Oh, it makes me smile every time I sort of see them. And when someone says, "Oh, you know, someone sent me a photo the other day," or tag me on actually tag me in Facebook, mm -hmm. um, you know, Santa came and you know here's four Ben Winspear riggers, <laughs> you know, and absolutely love them. Mm -hmm. And all I'm hearing is fantastic feedback f about them because and it's true they do everything I want them to do and I think people are finding you know how versatile they are it makes me smile every time and I just think I'm it's nothing I ever expected mm. um, and I feel absolutely honored absolutely but you know I really owe it to Bob senior you mm. know it's all been through um, my re my fantastic relationship with Bob senior mm-hmm he really listens to artists, doesn't he, Bob? Absolutely. It's fundamentally what his philosophy is about, is about supplying artists with the best quality materials so they can make great paintings. That's fantastic. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. right. Good man, Bob, Bob Senior. He's Very a fantastic good. fellow. You have to, yeah. Now, moving on, Ben, what are some of the advantages of being an ambassador for prestigious art material companies? Well, I think the primary one is being able to um, say, "Look, I believe in the product." Really, mm. it's not about uh, you know. I don't um, you know make anything out of it. Really, mm. uh, I don't make anything out of it. Not really. I just don't make anything out okay, of it. I don't right. need to. All right. Um, it's just because I believe in the products. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm happy to you know uh, to promote Michael Harding and Neef brushes to anybody. Because I use them and they work. Yeah, right, right. So nowadays, Ben, if you're using a paint that's not Michael Harding's, um, are you? E can you easily spot the difference? Yeah, 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 yeah I can. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit. Uh, what's the word? becomes a bit of a challenging conversation to the student. Sure. Uh, I won't name any names, no. but at our last retreat, um, I was doing a, a colour mixing exercise, particularly around greens, and using a, a yellow ochre. And it's just like, I can't make this work. Just pass me my paint kit, can you please? And I'll use a Michael Harding. And straight away, the difference was, I didn't say anything, I just did the mix mm. and basically the whole room erupted <laughs> because they see the difference. Right, right. And it's like anything, if you haven't been introduced, you know, if this is the level that you're using, mm. that's fine, but when you try something else, you then, it puts that other one into perspective. Sure. So that they speak for themselves when you use them. Right. So now that you've, uh, use Michael Harding paints and you're very familiar with them do you ever see yourself using other brands of oil paint? I, I do I do try them occasionally I like mm. to try mm. like Bob I like to just keep trying other things to see what happens sure what they're like I mean you know the colors slightly you know you can get I've got some rub outs that Bob's helped me make by sourcing I've got like 12 brands of yellow ochre and I've got 12 brands of burnt sienna mm -hmm. and it's amazing how different those 12 colors are it is it is incredible for how it varies from brand to brand yeah, company yeah. to company and you can make that work to your advantage if you want a particularly intense burnt sienna then you can go to this brand mm. Um, you know, some are a bit more oily than others. Um, mm. They all have their different characteristics. Sure. Now, in saying that, Ben, some artists in our tradition, some realist painters, um, have gone back to actually preparing their own paint, milling their own paint. Is that something that fascinates you? I don't let it. I mm. don't let it. Mm. I, I literally, I've, I have ground paint by hand in Rembrandt's studio. Wow. Yep, when I was visiting his studio, um, I don't know if you've been there, it's in the very narrow houses with the staircase. Okay. So the actual uh, tour of it, you're only allowed to go one way. Mm. So I'm going up, coming down and going up again, <laughs> going round and round for the whole day. Sure, sure. So the staff eventually like, who's this guy? Mm. Um, and they 
couple of the ladies come over and like, you know, you must be an artist. Eh? I'm like, yeah, look, I'm from Australia and, you know, this is fascinating. Mm. And they said, look, at three o'clock, um, we have this like paint grinding demonstration in his studio. Just make wow. sure you're there. Yeah. So I went there and the fellow, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily the, the tools Rembrandt no, used, but yeah. you're literally in his space and he's demonstrating how to grind paint. Mm -hmm. And oh, look, every now and again, I think about it. And it's like I didn't let it. I mm. just know it would take over. It is time I'd love to do it. Yeah, yeah. But, but it is very uh, yeah. labour intensive yeah. and and quite time consuming. Absolutely. So, look, I don't know. Maybe down the track somewhere. But at the moment, I am very cautious about letting that get a foothold. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> that makes sense. Moving on. Ben, I understand you are currently not represented by gallery. Is seeking gallery representation something that interests you? It, I have sporadic uh, bouts of it. I think, yeah, I'd like to have a gallery and I have had them. Mm -hmm. I have been represented by galleries, but um, mostly I don't need to. I find to sell, sell enough works to, you know, through word of mouth and I've got collectors. Mm. That's great. Um, yeah, that I just let it tick along like that. Sure. So your collectors um, are obviously curious as to what your next painting will be, and they make inquiries. And yeah, such. yeah. Or, or even I can I can call them and say I've got a particular painting. I think is you know one one collector in particular. Or, you know, very open to suggesting you need to. You know, this is a good. I think this painting should go in your collection. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. That's, that's great that you have that rela that relationship. Yeah. with your collectors yeah. very important absolutely. absolutely good good yeah um, you know uh, they see the value in owning my artworks and I see the value in them supporting what I it's a synergy because without them um, you know doing what they do they enable me to continue to do it it Patronage, works both ways so important yeah absolutely and there needs to be more conversations about that and and even education of the you know the average general public about how to support artists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it is really really important and it's something that um was very prevalent during you know yeah. pre 20th century uh times however now it is seems like it's becoming less popular i you know not I don't have as many conversations with artists as I like, but I, I I can't remember the last time I've spoken to an artist who's, who's mentioned their collectors. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's mostly, if you talk to artists, they're represented by galleries. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, having collectors that you have a relationship with, um, I think is a fantastic way to go. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Well said. Being a traditional painter, have you received your share of criticism throughout your life? Uh, not really. That's not, interesting. Not, not that I, not nothing that really sort of stands out. No, okay. no. Right. I mean, you, you, I mean, you hear the throwaway comment at times about you know, you know, represent, you know, you know, it's just a copy of something. Mm. But uh, no, I can't really think of anything in particular. No, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it's I think part of the um, you know the reason why you've had that experience is you never attended a university no. art school, no. done a degree in art in a university, and saw what it's kind of like from that perspective. The closest I've come is I've had quite a few friends that have gone through universities to study fine arts, and yeah, they've come out often come. Out. <laughs> quite distraught. Yeah, that that you, that says enough. Quite distraught. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the closest I've come, and and I have thought oh, I wouldn't want to be them. No, yeah, um, I wouldn't last five minutes. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a completely different world. Yeah, 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 yeah and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Sure, sure. Now, Ben, you have been involved in a multitude of art prizes throughout your time. Would you recommend other artists apply to art prizes and what do you think the advantages are of getting involved with them? Definitely. Um, at its core, you know, when you're selling paintings, you're running a business. Mm. 
and any business needs to advertise. So in some ways, you know, entering and winning an art prize is advertising yourself and sure what you do. Yeah. Um, it has many, many great benefits to it. You know, it has that, it has the, you know, we all need building up and that's, a, you know, in a healthy way, you know. When you're com healthily competing against your peers and mm. you have a success like that, then, yeah, we all need something like that. Mm -hmm. The money helps. Absolutely. Um, the recognition helps. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of benefits to it. So, yeah, I would. Mm. But having said that, I would advise against and occasionally I've fallen into the trap of just pursuing that world for finance sake yeah yeah um, and I was I uh, can't remember exactly how it all went but I was uh, listening to a clip by John Lennon the other day okay. talking about how be really careful about uh, he didn't actually use the word commissions, but making art for um, other people mm. because it can very easily detract, um, you know, it can detach you from that voice of, you know, that very unique personal voice. Absolutely. And if you've got a gallery driving you to make works or, you know, you sold one particular work and you think, oh, I'm going to just keep repeating that because it sells, mm. you've got to be really careful about that. Absolutely. It can, uh, get hold of you pretty easily it's kind of like selling your soul absolutely yeah mm -hmm. so walking that fine line between uh, you know having to run a business and make an income but not selling your soul is a challenge and I think uh, every artist that is exhibiting and selling um, you know constantly bumps up against it sure absolutely I understand you accept a small number of commissions every year but you very much prefer to create your own paintings what has your experiences been like in the world of commissions? It's funny. It's funny. I can accept a commission and no matter how challenge, challenging it is or no matter how easy it is, it just does not have the life, like the feel of wanting to do it that I with my own paintings. It's just weird. Does it it's feel like, like work to you? It just feels like, uh, it's, I wouldn't say soulless work, but it just feels like there is just hard very hard often to muster up the enthusiasm to do it mm -hmm. yeah it's just weird it's funny sure so I really admire people who can uh, you know make a living and do commission work and some people that's all they do mm. it's not for me mm. sure sure so you do limit the amount of commission I do take on. and I only really accept them if I have a huge amount of um, you know like it's my work, I'm going to make it how I need it to be made. Sure. Um, and that does, you know, there's not many people, you know, because often, and, and fair enough, um, people want uh, significant input into the commission. Sure, sure. Throughout your life thus far, you have successfully sold a number of paintings. What are some tips you would give to artists who are attempting to sell their work? Yeah, so we're going to cover all this next year in our uh, mentoring course because mm. it's all fine to make art, but then selling it and is a whole other story. Mm. Um, you know the pricing of it, how you you know how you come about that. Uh, you know the other thing. So as far as the quality goes and the the pursuit of excellence, the framing. Mm. Um, so my philosophy is to I give my customers the best product I can give them. Mm -hmm. Top quality materials, um, continually you know trying to understand the craft of oil painting so they last as long as they're able to. Mm. Um, you know continually giving them something that's um, painted by me, mm -hmm. of me. Sure. Um, and then on top of that framed properly um, mm -hmm. with good quality framing. Sure, right, right. So I'm very proud to hand out, whether it's in a, you know, a gallery or, or uh, you know, just uh, one of my collectors, I'm very proud to hand, hand over the work because I know it's the best I can make. Sure. And, and it's, it's made in that pursuit of excellence. Right. And how important do you think it is for 
artists who perhaps are attempting uh, to, to try and sell their work, how important is it to actually have an a online presence and to, to market yourself? I think it's absolutely vital these days. It's, it's, you know, love it or hate it, it's the way of the world and the future, isn't it? Sure. Um, yeah, and it doesn't have to be anything complex. It can just be a good quality Instagram page, mm -hmm. you know, where you're just showing, and I love the, and I try and do it myself a bit, um, I love the insights of behind the scenes, you know, whether it's, you know, just a short clip about the texture of a painting or an idea, yeah. the finished works, just the, the life of an artist. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think it's pretty much vital these mm -hmm. days. And mm -hmm. I know it's a challenge and it's been a challenge for me, but I think that, uh, you know, artists, they really need to just get the basics of, you know, social media down and have a presence. Absolutely. Very and a important. website. A website is really a business card these days. That's right. Uh, in saying that, uh, there are art students and artists who have a lot of doubt in their work and their ability. Uh, would you say it's very important that the artists start to take themselves seriously in regards to their, their, their work and their paintings and to develop things like business cards, handing them out to people that show interest in work, people well, they encounter. Again, this is going to be an ongoing conversation this year with my mentoring course because it's like, you know, it's all fine to, you know, you could be a person that has a great business card, great presence, great website, but then your work's not up to scratch. Right. Or you might not have much of it. So it's, it's about lining all those up mm. um, in a professional way um, so that you're, you know, you're, I guess, living and not only living, operating as an artist with integrity. Absolutely. Yeah. I well think said. ultimately that is the process of, you know, not uh, putting yourself out in the world too early, but when you are ready to do that, then doing it with confidence. And I think you definitely need mentors. You need someone who's going to support you through that because we all know creative people, as much as anyone else, if not more at times, has so much self-doubt. That's right. Absolutely. Doesn't uh, you know, there's no shortage of self doubt when it comes to, to artists yeah, and artists. Yeah, and it, you know, it's really, you know, it really. And this is why I want to do the mentoring course. It's mm. like, you know, when you see someone who's really got something to offer the world, and mm. they just feel like, you know, you, all they're talking about is how, you know, I need to do this and I need to improve, and my work's not very good, and mm -hmm. you know, you just want to, you know, you, if you can, I just want to say, you know, no, this is where you're at. And, um, you know, you need to get your work out there. Absolutely. I think uh, a person that can create an image, um, you know, is in a very good position to be able to earn a, a good living. Yes. You know, even yes. if it does mean at times taking more of a commercial route. Correct. Doing things like this. Um, I think we do need to get out of this, this old fashioned mentality of the starving artist. Yes, absolutely. Teaching students, uh, art students, uh, financial literacy and how they can go ahead and market their work to, to sell work, to earn a living, to live a good life yes. is something that we should be paying more attention to as we go. And I've got a lot to learn, but I've got a lot to offer, you know, through my, my 20 plus years experience, which is what I'm gonna pass on to my students next year in my mentoring course of, you know, answering and having some dis lots of discussions around because uh, now they're making work about where do they go from here what mm. is how do you know what's the standards you're going to uh, set that when you meet those then you're ready to you know put the work out there you're going to have an exhibition uh, you know and this is what they're going to do is they're going to pick a particular you know art prize and work for that that's it and it's so important that transitional phase from student to emerging artist yes and that can really be the make or break point yes. for a lot of artists as well. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think I um, haven't actually personally uh, spoken to anyone about it, but I have sort of observed, yeah, that is, it could can be a breaking point where people actually, they just don't have that last bit to get over the line to do mm -hmm. it, and they're off doing something else in life and it's all gone. Yeah. So, that's yeah. Right. Look, uh, you know, we need artists more than ever now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Artists really help us see. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, approaching the end of the interview, Ben, what are some of the things nowadays that are motivating you to continue to paint? 
Look, it's become, in many ways, it's gone from being really complex to simple. Um, and it's as simple as the absolute love of it. It's just literally like breathing to me now. Mm. It's like I could not see myself doing anything else. It doesn't wow. mean I don't go and do any other things. Mm. Um, you know, for many, for a long time, you know, periodically you'd be like, oh, this is all too hard, you know, particularly financially. Um, I'm gonna, just going to do, do something else, but I don't get that anymore. It's just like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, I don't, I'm never going to retire. Great. I don't, retirement, I've got no concept of what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to keep painting um, because I just absolutely love it. Absolutely. Speaking of motivation and, and inspiration, uh, I did notice on your website when looking <coughs> at your um, book list that one of the books listed there was the, the Holy Bible. Yes. Uh, does faith uh, play any role in your life at all? Sure, sure. I'm a, a believer in the Creator and, you know, as, as you know, I spend a lot of the time out in nature and I just look at the absolute, it is the greatest work of art. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. And when you really see it, you know, in, in snippets at times, because we don't see it clearly all the time, mm -hmm. of how complex it is, mm -hmm. how beautiful it is how amazingly put together it is it's just like yep it is the greatest work of art and you know what better to draw from than that mm -hmm. so when you are out landscape painting and and looking at the landscape observing it you see the work of a creator yes i do absolutely That's fantastic. well yep, done i do well done now what are some of the things that you'd like to achieve in the next five years with your work I mean, my real goal, my goals really aren't external. As long as I can make a good, yeah, reasonable living out, I don't want to be rich, you know, as long as I can make a living out of pay my bills, you know, do what I need to do, run my business, that's, that's all, you know, that's great. But my real goals are internal of, you know, bigger paintings, multi-figure paintings, mm. um, uh, ideas I'd like to explore, um, and even sculpture. Yep. And I've Fantastic. decided if I lose my eyesight, I'm taking up sculpture. You can do it by feel. <laughs> by feel, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well said. Do you see yourself continuing to paint for the rest of your life, or will there come a point when you stop? And you have touched upon that right in now. Your previous I can't ever see that happening. Yeah. I definitely can't see that happening. I can't see, you know, it's just. I'm not saying the making the each painting is easy, but just the it's just my way of breathing and being painting. That's great. And it's when I get in the studio, like particularly over Christmas and, and have a good stint, it always makes me realise it just makes my life feel normal. Mm. The rest of my life feel normal. And I always think, yeah, that's what was missing. Wow. You know, so when, wow. I'm, when I'm, you know, teaching and doing all the other things, running a business, and then I get in the studio, it's like, yeah, yeah that's what was missing. Wow. Uh, when you are painting, are you happy? Do you get frustrated? All of it. You experience all yeah, emotions. Oh, all the time. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. It's an absolute roller coaster. And, you know, I, I take a real interest in reading about the, the lives of artists, modern and, uh, you know, older ones, because I'm fascinated with how often they deal with it. Um, some of them in very destructive ways, as yeah. we know. And, you know, I don't blame them one bit mm. because that, uh, you know, that internal world of lots of feelings and, you know, the whole gamut of emotions going, you know, from elation to absolute despair when it's not working. Sure. And that can happen in 30 seconds right. with the wrong brush strokes. That's right. Um, you know, so I'm just always really interested in seeing how other artists deal with it, you know, for, through their diaries or through their, often their spouses writing about how sure. they dealt with it. And, mm. um, yeah, it's just fascinating. Sorry, what was the question? So I was just asking um, uh, at that point if you, when you, when you are painting, if you're in a, in a in a happy state or whether you are frustrated, you have bad days painting. So I'm... Uh, yeah, look, I have bad days, but the underlying, uh, but mostly good days, you know, and up and down through it all. Mm. But the underlying is just a real joyful, I just love it. It's mm -hmm. just joy, you know, it's like that constant underneath it all. And yes, you know, there's all those other emotions going up and down. Mm. 
but you know one of the the absolute beauty of it is is having the training you can't go wrong right mm -hmm. if you always go back to your training when things aren't going well you can always get the painting back on track that's right well said yeah well said so it doesn't matter how rocky it gets i know if i just persevere and follow my uh, training and get, you know and, and bring the training to the fore then the painting gets back on track and i'm off again so fantastic that's well said ben what advice would you give to painters out there who are earnest about improving their craft? Paint, paint. It's it's so much about the brush mileage, mm -hmm. um, and you've just got to paint lots of bad paintings. Mm -hmm. You just got to paint bad paintings, good paintings, bad paintings, and all the ones in between. Sure. Do you think consistency is important? In consistency in painting quality while continuing to paint painting you know five yeah. times a week yeah I, I think you need to paint as often as you can mm -hmm. um, I think you paint need to paint at least once a week so I, I paint at least once a week mm. um, and that's not enough mm. at times but um, yeah as much as you can I think you know a month apart so it's way too long do you find you get a little bit sloppy when you have extended breaks when you come rusty. back to it? You yeah, do you get, get rusty. rusty. Yeah, it's like not riding a bike for a month and then you get back on and that first two minutes is a bit wobbly. Sure. Do you know what I mean? You just, yeah. you know, you're just getting the feel of it again. So mm -hmm. the longer you're out of it, the longer it takes to get back to the feel of it. Because it is a hand-eye coordination Absolutely. thing as well. Yeah. And it's a real finessed one. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's like any fine art or sports you know it, to do it well you've got to you know when you get up to that level you've got to you know keep being consistent about your practice absolutely that's very important so one of the things i've sh the shifts that have happened in my mind over the last you know 10 years is gone from making paintings to just painting now it's just a process i don't see one painting as a beginning and end it's just a making paintings just make continuously making yeah, paintings. Yeah, continuously making paintings. I'm not fussed about the start. I'm not fussed about the finish. I'm fussed about making paintings. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And I, I suppose when you are in that kind of state of mind, that does help you not become disheartened by if a painting doesn't work sure. out. Sure. So, you know, you, you, I sort of have these three streams and, a, a, you know, they, they pile up, you know, over time. And then um, maybe once every few months or, or six months, I'll go through them. One pile goes in the bin, one pile goes into my private collection where I think, you know, and there's not a lot of them, you know, where I think that was a real milestone for whatever reason. Mm. And then the rest go, you know, these all support, you know, I can sell these. And then there's some others where I keep to, to paint from as well. Sure. Um, so the ones that go in the bin, it's just like, you know, I don't think about it as a waste of time or a waste of paint. Mm. Um, because I couldn't got to the others without doing those. That's right. It's it's a learning experience. Yeah, so you are improving through so that process. So my whole mindset has been shift is shifted to the process. It's just a process. Mm -hmm. Just make it a process as opposed to obsessing about each painting, good. which is what I used to do. Good. That's a good way of approaching it and think, yeah. thinking about the practice of painting. Yep. In conclusion. I understand you have a number of workshops and artist retreats coming up in 2023. Would you like to state them here for viewers? Yes, so I have three retreats coming up at King Valley. Uh, we have one in autumn, I think it's May. Uh, I think the winter one is uh, May, June, July. And then the summer one is always the first uh, week in December. Okay, great. They're five days and uh, five nights. Mm -hmm. um, and absolutely fabulous time. Absolutely love it. Sure. Get away from everything. Um, yeah, no Beautiful. Phones. It's good. Great. And if students want to enrol in your year-long painting course? Yes, um, it's all open now on my website. Mm -hmm. um, but they can join during the year as well or they can take a look at it and contact me and I'm um, happy to have a chat and set them up for possibly next year. Fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, if I can help them in any way, they're more than welcome. Mm -hmm. And every month you've got the paint out, every everyone's month. invited. Yep, I think this year it's the third, it's generally the third Sunday of the month, Sunday afternoon, 
and it's open to anyone, any medium. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a opportunity for artists to get together. Often, you know, we try and pick places where there's obviously facilities, but also a cafe or something. Mm -hmm. So often we have a meal or a cup of coffee together before or after. Sure. And again, have a you know, short burst of that camaraderie. Absolutely. And it does re-energize you fantastic. once you've been in the studio for quite some time, painting away to get out be amongst like-minded people. Yeah, it's just good to hear someone else say, oh, I'm struggling with this painting. Sure. Or, you know, it's going really, really well, and I tried this, and you think, well, just, you know, someone randomly would like, oh, I just tried this colour, and it's fantastic, a fan, mm. and blah, 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 and you think, yeah, well, okay, I'll try that as well. So Absolutely. It's, you learn, just be open to learning from anybody. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's that's good advice, and a, and a good uh, note to end on. Yes. Ben, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being generous with your time and allowing me to uh, sit here today and speak to you, question you about your life and your work. I'm a big fan of your paintings uh, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing the development of your art academy into the future and what comes of your body of work as you continue painting into the future. Thank you for doing what you're doing. You're a, a very fine uh, Australian painter uh, it's very, very uh, important to have you representing uh, us as Australian painters, being a, a, a Michael Harding's brand ambassador, uh, being an Eve Brush ambassador as well. Um, you are doing a great job of representing the kind of standard of painters that we have here in Australia. So I just wanted to personally say thank you very much and, and please keep doing what you're doing. Keep, uh, keep painting away and keep entering in your, um, your art prizes. You've obviously been very successful with them in the past and um, I very much look forward to following your work into the future. Uh, just before we do conclude, I wanted to ask if you want to share um, your contact details so that uh, viewers may get in touch with you if they wish to. Sure. So I have a website. It's just benwinspearart.com.au, mm -hmm. www.benwinspearart.com.au. I have Instagram, which is Ben Winspear Artist, and the same on Facebook, Ben Winspear Artist. Sure. And if anyone wants to, on my website, there's a free content section, so we're adding to, constantly adding to that. So there's uh, resources there for oil painters and some drawing resources. Mm. Please feel free to use those, as much, and you know, if you know someone who needs some resources like that. And if anyone wants to look, I'm happy to help anyone out, you know, just to add to this wonderful world of painting. So Absolutely. if anyone needs some help with anything, um, my number's on my website. Send me an email, give me a call. Sure. And what is your email, Ben? My email is ben at benwinspearart.com. Fantastic. Not dot .au. It's dot .com. Dot .com, dot, not dot .au. Yep. Okay, very good. Once again, Ben, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate you elaborating all your answers. Thanks, Emilio. I really appreciate you having me on and asking all these fabulous questions. And it's just been really great to just, uh, yeah, be able to share insights into my painting practice and um, yeah I think what you're doing is absolutely fabulous as well thank you and, I appreciate uh, that. you know great to be part of a collaboration like this thank you Thanks thank for you for your me. time it's been it's been a, a real privilege for me yeah thank you very well no worries thank you Thanks. see you later okay bye